we'll get started with a um, karakia from Councillor Galloway. <laughs> e te hui, whae te matauranga ki a marama, ki a whae takana mahi katoa, tu maia, tu kaha, aroha mai, aroha atu, tātou i a tātou katoa. For this gathering, we seek knowledge, for understanding, have purpose in all we do, stand tall, be strong, let us show respect for one another. Kia ora, thanks Ian. Um, and we have uh, some apologies today. We've got um, early departure from the Mayor, Deputy Mayor and Councillor Major. Um, any other apologies? No, do I have a mover for those, Sam? Seconder? Tim? Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Um, it's carried, thank you very much. Um, any declar declarations of interest for today? No. No. Um, and confirmation of previous minutes. Do I have a mover for those? Oh. Jamie. Just minor correction. Uh, item 13 of the minutes, the wire fence one. I think Gough, Davidson, McDonald and Chu ask that their vote against be recorded. And so if you could pop that in, Aidan, that would be great. Thanks. It was a heritage wire fence. It was a heritage wire fence. <laughs> <laughs> like, my apologies. Yeah. Yeah. So with that um, amendment, um, so we do add in some wording that the minutes of the, I can't read that. With the thing in the front now. Just note those changes. You've got them? Do you, we don't need to note them in the resolution? No? Okay. Okay. Um, so, mover then. Jamie, seconder, Pauline. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Any against? Carried. Thank you very much. And we now we move to public forum. So, uh, first up today, we have Andrew and Cleve um, who are coming to talk to us about. Uh, Big Street Bikers Project um, and the Locky Docks. So welcome, um, we've got five minutes and if you press the button and the thing, yep, and then just, you just press that so it turns green, yep, and they're okay. shared so you don't need to press them again to the end. Awesome. Kia ora koutou, uh, thank you for having us again. We were here um, in 2019 I believe and we um, came to introduce what we were planning to do with the Locky Docks and now we're coming to say this is uh, what has happened and uh, tell you the success that we've experienced um, with this prototype which is leading the nation uh, in terms of um, electric mobility and sustainable transport. Um, uh, so yeah, we'll just take sure. We've, um, there's some research that uh, Waka Katahi has done to support this and from our own findings as well. Uh, just to remind you, so our vision is for a happy, healthy, carbon-free Aotearoa supported by Mercury around the country to do this and um, currently installing sites um, in other cities now. Um, so we've made it free to the public and uh, free to property owners to use this infrastructure for secure parking. Uh, this is Robbie Henderson here who um, we were introduced to by Vicky Buck when we presented uh, 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 last year, or the year before. Um, Rob installed the network here in Christchurch and now is subsequently installing uh, Lockie Docks all around the country So, um, and his team of contractors and uh, planning people as well, so it's creating um, business for people here. Uh, what the Lockie Docks do is create awareness for the safe bike paths and safe routes, provide secure parking and free charging. So um, one of the key aspects of it is that so the, on the digital screens they have maps on there that we co-designed with uh, the City Council uh, biking team and with Waka Katahi. Um, we, uh, Waka Katahi did some research on it and found that people found them very useful, uh, which we, we think is really um, a really important thing um, in terms of removing the barriers for pe getting people on bikes and knowing that there are safe ways to get around. There are bike paths and other safe um, back streets to take. Um, so a really important part of the equation. Um, we're changing out the headlines to prompt more people who drive to um, take up biking. So it's all keeping it really up upbeat. Um, so every time someone locks a bike, we have um, a data point on that. So we know how many bikes have been parked. Um, they um, started pretty quietly in um, June last year when we installed the network. Um, but things have been ramping up over the last six months. Um, people, every, um, as you see, 92% of people find it really easy to use. We've had um, uh, 2,869 bikes parked since then, and zero thefts. Um, and this is an image of most of the locky docks around now, you're seeing them quite full. 
um, and requests for a lot of extra sites. Um, really strong trend developing, and this is the where it's getting really interesting. So we're seeing an 18% increase of bike parks, bikes parked month on month. So on that trajectory, uh, we're looking to install more locky docks um, as the, we reach capacity with the current locky docks. Um, and then so you just see there for the month of March, that was 766 uh, bikes parked. That's, that's that many less cars on the road. So it's doing a very direct job in terms of reducing emissions. Uh, measurable job. Um, so this is another interesting pattern that uh, so we see so here you see as the time of day that people are parking so we see that these are actually commuters so the, as an example this is one locky dock on Tuam Street so we see that these people are parking at 8 a.m. in the morning so we know that they're coming in to park for the day for work um, and so that's a really encouraging pattern so that means that it's um, less congestion less, em less emissions. Uh, so our impact formula from this is, um, so this is what we're beginning to model, um, so we can see, um, so on the left hand side it's all about increasing uh, feeling of safety through knowing there's safe bike routes, through knowing your bike's not going to get stolen, it's easy and convenient to use and there's a normal, because it's highly visible it makes it look like it's a, it's a cool thing to do to ride a bike. Um, so uh, the outcomes being reducing emissions, reducing congestion and improving mental health, physical health, uh, resilience in the community, um, helping retailers and so on. So the really, really measurable um, outcomes and so we're starting to put um, numbers to all those outcomes now um, and so that'll be the, our next report which is more detailed. Um, a big upshot, so as soon as it was announced, after we announced launching it in Christchurch we had um, Literally, um, property owners from Queenstown driving up to Christchurch and saying, can we get some down here? We had Napier City Council have uh, written their own licensed occupier agreement for us to put locky docks into Napier. Uh, Palmston North, New Plymouth, Taupo, Taronga, uh, Hamilton, uh, Auckland. We're currently installing in Auckland, Wellington at the moment. Um, so there's been amazing demand all off the back of the initiative in Christchurch. So it started here first, I want you to all know that. Um, <laughs> and so as a consequence, so the government is um, hugely supportive of this. So you see um, uh, Minister of Energy, Megan Woods, there, and Minister of Transport, Michael Wood, when we uh, announced our rollout plans nationwide in Wellington last year, both of them came out on the night to speak and, um, and even uh, Wakakata has offered us a site on Wellis Street in Wellington as a model for more sites, um, publicly owned sites across the country. Uh, here's a list of all the people who are in places where they want to have more locky docks in Christchurch. Um, so, yeah, yeah, there's more and more. Um, so just as a reminder, so it's a self-funded public infrastructure model, so it's free to the public and to the property owner, and it's made possible through um, content partners and sponsors and so this is where it's uh, community engagement comes you know the likes from the council um, from uh, Christchurch NZ from other local businesses and brands like Mercury that help make this happen I'm getting all the signals to say <laughs> hurrah thank you very much <laughs> um, so this is the end thank you so much um, just the and beginning. unfortunately your time is up that was the launch day last June um, and I know that the bakery in Rangiora is um, getting rave reviews for having the, the locky docks out there. I don't know when they went in, but um, yeah. Yeah, just, a, just about a month ago. Right, I was yeah. getting good yeah. reviews online, which yeah. is good. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for coming in and giving us an update on those. Um, really good to see, and I'm sure we'll see more of them around. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Cheers. Right, and now we have um, uh, Professor Chris Kisling and Mr Trevor Lord from the Maclean's Mansion Charitable Trust. Thank you for coming in today and giving us an update. Yeah. It's on. It's on. <clears throat> ah, good morning and thank you for this opportunity. Um, to talk to you about McLean's Mansion and what progress we've been making there. And in five minutes, that's a pretty short time. We'll <laughs> gallop. Um, our update to you today really is to convey our pride as trustees and how we are managing to effect considerable progress on the mansion, 
within budget, which remains valid, and on schedule despite COVID-19 delays and things like that. And your heritage unit has commended and improved the approach that we have taken uh, in spending the, that very significant landmark heritage grant that came through this council. Without a doubt, I think if that grant had not been made, the mansion would ha not have survived. Uh, so we're very grateful. So we're here today to, really to account to you on that progress. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and commencing the update, I just wanted to begin by showing you the, the photograph at the top, and I think that says an awful lot about this impressive, massive uh, building of, of real big stature internationally that we're dealing with on the city's behalf. By way of a perspective to open, and it's very important this, we're going to look at the heritage and cultural value of the mansion because this really underpins why we're bothering and why this is worth so much. It's one of the world's largest Victorian timber mansions. It was built in a Jacobean style in the manner of a major English country house, and in fact one built for the Rothschild family. It was fitted out accordingly to a palace standard, very rare in Christchurch, and sparing no expense. Interestingly, it was the vision of Mr. Alan McLean, a very successful Canterbury run holder. And the important part here is that the house and fortune were actually destined for the care of women in need, not just a house. It was very much this vision. It was a major statement and remains so even now for women's welfare internationally. The McLean Institute, which he formed, is arguably New Zealand's first true social welfare model, conceived in about 1898. And it's still operating, and they're very keen to return to the mansion, some excitement there. It's internationally unique, and the main thing is it's right here in the Christchurch CBD. Introducing the project, we first spoke to the committee in mid-2016. We outlined then our vision and purpose, which was to restore and preserve the mansion uh, it was a multi, as a multifaceted attraction for the city and community with paid entry at the time. We're going to look at education and art, music, Canterbury history, etc., and even include an art gallery. A grant of $1.934 million was duly awarded in December 2016, and this came from the Central City Landmark Heritage Grant Fund, and we believe with gratitude it was and remains the largest heritage grant ever awarded by the city. So the mansion was uh, purchased, uh, or the agreement to purchase was uh, a little bit later in August 2018, and in January 2019 the heritage covenant aspect of that purchase was resolved with the mortgagor and work started. Continuing uh, into looking at progress of this slide gives you some idea of what's been going on. To uh, restore this building required the foundations to be remediated. Um, that has been done with some quite clever engineering. It's done. Um, the building is now level, um, and the uh, internal strengthening uh, can continue. And the net result of all that was that this building will uh, well exceed the national uh, code, uh, national building standards. Um, on the slide in, that you've got in front of you, uh, it gives you some of that sort of detail. And we've only got one minute left, apparently, so we'll push on. Updating the intended purpose, we're, now, we're an educational charitable trust which gives us wide scope. The business plan has transitioned to a commercial tenancy model, which allows now free public access, simpler and more sustainable model for the trust to administer. And it provides a means to continue the building preservation from income. The present model still holds as fundamental principles, things like education act and activities and arts, music, heritage and cultural significance of the mansion as a vibrant and vital community asset when few such options that still exist in the CBD and as an internationally iconic presence for tenants. We are currently negotiating with the Christchurch School of Music and the McLean Institute, as I mentioned before, as major users. That could see things like 1,200 students, 40 practice rooms on Saturday, and so on, with some funding required. And it preserves the mansion's original and intended community purpose and social roles. Uh, really, to conclude, um, anyone who um, doubted that this significant heritage building could not be restored and made available for future viable use can put those doubts aside. Um, there is, however, no hiding the fact that uh, 
as a trust, we are facing a, a big hurdle to pay out the Murray family their interest-free uh, three-year mortgage that they have on the land. We are open, therefore, to um, suggestions for help to assist us to get to that point from any source whatsoever. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> thank you very much. And um, sorry, you do have you have reached the end of your time there. Yeah. Um, but thank you for the update. And people have um, had a chance to read the whole presentation already. And so um, there may be further communication, I guess, between us um, in the that future. Would be great. Thank you, thank very, you very much. much. Right, there are no deputations by appointment, no presentation of petitions. So now we move on to paper seven, the proposed consultation on freedom camping bylaw changes. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we can take the report as read, but if you could give us uh, the, the quick update on the, um, the government's new plans and why we're still going ahead with this, that would be really useful. Sure. Um, do you want me to do a summary of the bylaw changes Very as well? Quick. Very quick. Yeah. Um, so I guess the main point with the bylaw is that we need to review it and we need to complete the review, otherwise the bylaw will lapse. Um, so we've been working on this um, for some time and you had a report about this in October last year, which is the first step in the review. This is the second step. Um, so we've got some um, changes that we're recommending, which um, generally we think the bylaw is working quite well, um, but the review gives us an opportunity to update and improve things where we can. Um, the, in the meantime, since um, preparing this work, the government has proposed changes to freedom camping nationally. Um, these proposals will likely lead to changes to the Freedom Camping Act, which this bylaw is made under. So the key point here is that the national changes won't be finalised for some time, um, perhaps late next year by the time the legislative changes go through. So we need to complete the review of our bylaw, um, including this consultation phase at the moment, or our bylaw will lapse, which means it automatically revokes. Um, the bylaw changes that we're proposing here are likely to be um, fully completed before December this year, so they'll be um, on a much faster track. Um, once the uh, national changes are finalised, there'll be an implementation process. Um, there might be regulations that sit under it, for example, so that will push the dates out even further. And there's strong support for this bylaw, so we don't want to risk not having a bylaw while we're in a place of legislative uncertainty. Um, so we need to be clear about that in our consultation information, including the statement of proposal. So there's a, a small amendment um, to that referenced in the additional recommendations which were in the supplementary memo which was circulated. Um, the timeframes for the council to make a submission um, on the national consultation are also quite tight, so there's a um, recommendation to delegate the finalisation of that submission um, to the chair of the committee and members that want to be involved. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I think if can we see all of those recommendations up there? Um, so the additional recommendations, and I think that's put um, councillors Turner and Daniels on, as well as me. Um, so uh, if people are okay with that, seem to be this morning. Okay, and um, number 10 there is changed um, to, it's sort of gone in with the original one. Is that right? Yeah, yeah from the very top because otherwise right. they were repeating themselves. No other changes from the ones in the memo though? No. Okay, any questions? Yeah, yeah. Yep. So any questions first, Yanni? Thank you, thank you for the work that you've done on this. Um, un under the um, page 28, uh, paragraph three, North Beach Car Park, you talk about um, the fact that uh, the number of freedom campers in 37 has reduced from high levels, um, but you're still saying there's still a steady number of campers in the area, I, despite the lack of international travellers. I guess what I was trying to understand is ha, ha, what sort of um, uh, what are we seeing in regards to people who actually need housing? Like, is this sort of people that are homeless or transient or living in cars versus, um, I guess the perception of you know young people coming from overseas or around New Zealand freedom camping? So there's a mix of different issues there. One is that because we put a temporary closure on that car park sort of over the last year, that has meant that we've seen a reduction in people camping there, so that's been working quite well. Um, the, 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 the range of campers that are in that area um, is buried. Um, there are absolutely some people who are genuinely homeless in that and some um, frequent freedom campers. 
Um, the homelessness um, is not treated in the same way as freedom camping, um, so we wouldn't infringe somebody who's um, homeless and living out of their vehicle. We would take a different approach to that, um, which is um, more sort of wraparound service and engaging with them and trying to see what we can do to support and encourage them to be in a more secure housing situation. Um, so the, the issues are quite separate in terms of how we would enforce right. the limitations in the bylaw. So do we do we have a sense of the percentage of those that are freedom camping, for, you know, for leisure, recreation versus um, people that need somewhere to stay the night? All that data is available from the monitoring and enforcement that's been done over the summer. I don't have it with me at the moment, but I can I can find out from the okay. enforcement team. Thanks. Cheers. Any further questions? No, in that case, do I have a mover for the staff recommendations? This is, yep, Tim, thank you, and um, Phil for seconding. Uh, do I have any debate? Um, Tim. Yeah, look, first of all, thank you very much for this, and it is um, a hell of a lot of work having to do, redo bylaws every five years, so, and this has been a particularly hot potato, there's no question about it. Just, just want to remind people that we are in a COVID situation, so the pressure is off a bit. So we're kind of in a, taking a breath for a while. But the two areas that are mentioned, which are Naval Point and North Beach, which have been problem areas without question, there are other areas around Christchurch which were added to when those were put in. So just we're not out of the park yet, and um, there are going to be some issues in the future. But I do commend the staff for what they do, and also our regulatory staff who go there and try and make the assessment between homeless and freedom camping, because there is a very big difference to that. So thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Andrew. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would agree that the current bylaw is working well, but equally I would agree that um, there is a continued need for a bylaw. Um, I'm certainly pleased to see the um, changes to the national situation proposed by government. Um, I've certainly commented in this chamber before about the need for some changes to the Act and the national situation and some consistency. Um, and the proposals that um, government have put forward pick up some of the discussions and recommendations of the local and central government working party, um, of which I've been a part since its inception. So I'm pleased to see some of that work finally being picked up. Um, as stated in the memo, which is in the agenda, the proposed changes from government don't affect our need to review the bylaw, and I'm pleased that we um, are in a position where we can continue to do that anyway. Um, I, I welcome the review, I welcome the um, proposal and the, the changes that are proposed within it, and thank staff for what I know has been a significant amount of work to um, get this to the point where we can consider it today. Um, reflecting some of Tim's comments, I am aware of some concerns and some issues in different parts of the city. Some of them certainly are picked up in the proposed changes in the um, document that's in front of us, the draft documents in, in front of us. Um, I regularly get comment from people in the community about freedom camping um, issues or, or things that people are not happy about or would suggest improvements to. And of course, in various different parts of the city, they manifest themselves differently. Consulting on this draft bylaw is the opportunity for people to have their say on that and to make those comments in a more formal sense. And I know there are some people out there who have got comments who are waiting for this opportunity who certainly will be providing that feedback at that time. So I would encourage those people and others to take that opportunity to provide their views on this proposal. Um, and certainly I welcome that consultation feedback. So fully supportive of this today. Thank you. Any further debate? No, in that case, I'll put this. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, I declare that carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. Um, now we move to paper eight, the Mayor's Welfare Charitable Trust bequest. So, Sam. Check. Do you want Anne and I to participate or stand back from this? Right. If you've got a conflict, you've got a conflict. Well, we're on the trust, but the committee. On the committee. Yes, and it's chair, and I'm deputy chair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. I, that's a so it's not for me to decide your conflicts. I'd ask at the beginning of the meeting for declarations of interest, but if you, you, you declare them during the meeting, and I think that that sounds sensible. Um, so we're not making... No, there's a recommendation from the Trust. To be honest, I can't see why they 
I don't see where there's an actual conflict. No. Mm. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, that's not my decision on whether you feel conflicted or not. Okay, excellent. We'll just keep forward, keep moving forward then. Um, so, Sam, could you give us a, just a, a brief summary? Kia ora koutou. Yeah, sure. Um, so, the Mayor's Rafa Charitable Trust received a bequest many years ago, uh, and uh, it's been slowly accumulating in the in the trust accounts, and it's currently six hundred ninety thousand dollars. But because of the low interest environment, it's not returning a lot to the trust. So, the committee, um, which two councillors here are on as representative, and a whole lot of uh, representatives from social agencies discuss the best use of it. Uh, staff recommendation was to use it as grants over a five-year period to help those uh, experiencing hardship and distress. Um, others on the committee felt we could it could be invested to give long-term return, uh, with one possibility being into community housing to also increase housing stock uh, in that area in Christchurch. So the report in front of you has the uh, committee recommendation to uh, asking council to to ask staff to investigate investment options. Uh, and there's also a staff recommendation, uh, as discussed, to, to use it as grants. So should council go ahead and, and choose to ask staff to investigate investment options, a report would return in a few months' time with some of those options and the option to distribute the bequest as grants over five years' time for you as a council to decide the way forward. And then the committee would, would go ahead and um, continue on with, with that delegation. Thank you. And when could you get that information back to us? Uh, we're hopeful we could come back in the, 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 at the July meeting. Which is our next meeting. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Thank you. Jake. Um, I guess a small matter. Why is this, why have you sought to write a report to, to ask us for permission to go investigating different options as opposed to just investigating the options and then bringing it back? Twofold. One is it can take quite a lot of staff time and work. Uh, and, and therefore, if we go ahead and do all that investigation and, and discover that council have no interest in the Mayor's Welfare Charitable Trust making an investment, then that's been a pointless body of work. So we wanted to get the direction of council. Um, it's, it's your delegation rather than the committees. And, and with it, we'd go ahead and do that work. But we didn't think it was worthwhile putting that work in if it didn't have any interest to you as councillors. Thank you. Tim. As this originally came, and so part C is what we discussed with regards to changing the, the initial, with which was set, uh, putting in, investing it into social housing. Um, would we not be better just to get some feedback on the economics or the investment um, um, environment at the moment, and then that be brought back to council? Because originally this was to invest into social housing, which I. Obviously, we've changed it. So, rather than a report, could we not get some? We've got um, Christchurch NZ, which have a very, apparently have a very good feel of the investment in so cycles. We've also got CCHL, which could actually give some very good information to our staff. I'm just wondering about that. I mean, this has just happened this morning. The changes. Sure. So, I so that would be part of a report okay. to include um, back to you the investment environment, okay. and that would inform the actual decision uh, in July. Thank you. Pauline. Yeah, Sam, can I just ask, um, you, in the report you say you received 750 requests for support in 2019-20 year, yep. totalling 358,800 of the grants. How much did the requests total? Uh, it's not quite that simple because we don't ask for a specific amount. What are you requesting? Yep. It'll be a bit uh, variable. Say, for example, a, a typical request might be a, a highly overdue power account, yep. which has been increasing, sometimes up towards of $2,000 owing, uh, and, and we'll work with that person and, and with some other agencies to try and, you know, to, to ensure they don't get their power disconnected and we might grant, say, $600. So, so I you couldn't tell you exactly what the requests were for because people don't come with a set amount, they just come with their distress. Right. And we seek to assist. So. so, are you turning people away because of lack of funds, or do you find the fund is sitting no, about? No, right? it's pretty well balanced in terms of um, what we've got coming in on an annual basis and what we're granting out. But there is there is greater need out there. But we we control the the in the the point of request. 
it has has some uh, funnel to it. Uh, with with greater funds, we could increase that funnel and, and increase the amount. We could, um, because currently, um, what are you bringing in from the um, dividends and strengthening communities? Is is it three hundred and something? A it's year? around. It varies, but it's around about three hundred and fifty thousand. So quite close to what you're yes, putting it is. out. Yes, Thanks to your director's fees and the strengthening communities grant. So you wouldn't be dipping into the bequest money very much every year. We're not. As, no, because we, we currently that's set aside and, and, and under kind of a different delegation, so yeah. we don't dip into it's it other it than the all. small amount of interest that is returned. Yeah. Um, however, so the decision from council could change the way the committee, you know, d distributes grants to help more people. Um, because we then could dip into it, yeah. should, should that decision be made. Yeah, and just one more question, if I may. Um, with the government's winter power um, mm -hmm. grants, are you seeing less people having to come for power? Would you anticipate you'd see less people? Because that's a reasonably generous amount, isn't it? Yeah, I think it changes maybe the timing a little bit. So we're seeing people now because it hasn't kicked in yet, um. uh, and then what we find in winter, we, we often do a little bit more in the firewood space than in the power. Um, and then once that with the fuel package comes off, um, it can it can kick back in again for people. So yeah, it does does change it a little bit. But still, some people get themselves in a, in a they find themselves in a really difficult situation, and, and that winter fuel package isn't enough to to get yeah. them out. So that we still see that. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? James, happy to move? Yeah, happy to move. The, the recommendations are up there now? The recommendations are up there now. Okay. With a sec oh, and you've got the second tea and fill pot in one now too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a seconder, Jake? Any debate? No, in that case I'll, I'll yeah. end. Yeah, thank yeah. you. No, I, I wanted to just um, say that the committee is supportive of this because we're aware of the, the growing need. Um, people are coming to the Mayor's Welfare to a Taupua, which means support, um, and that need is only going to increase. So there's that tension between being able to respond to that need, but also to sustain the, the fund so that we can continue to respond in the future. So this is about um, investigating options for maintaining the fund. So um, I'm really happy that um, it's going to be supported today um, and we look forward to the report. But I'd also like to acknowledge the work that Sam and Brian Pegler do in this space. Um, Brian particularly is the front person and deals with uh, those who come uh, uh, needing assistance and is incredibly compassionate and supportive and uh, I feel very proud to be chair of this um, committee. It's, uh, we do some great work. So thanks Sam. That's great. Tom. Thank you, and I'm, I'm really happy to support this because um, I think this is what it should have been in the, the beginning to invest, uh, to look at any and in, in all investment processes with regards to increasing the amount available to the needy and who, who requires it, rather than just concentrating on social housing, so which it was originally. So I'm really pleased to support this. Thank you, um, Yanni. Then Andrew. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm. Happy to support this, although I do think, um, you know, it, I hope this doesn't um, get mean that we don't look at, at the housing. Just to show you the housing register from 2018, 10,000 people gone up to 22,000 December 2020. So there's a massive need for housing, uh, social housing, affordable housing, community housing in our city um, and in our country. So I just wanted to, um, you know, say that I think we should certainly be looking at um, what we can do. Uh, but you know, I think this is sensible that we look at what's the best option to create a sustainable income source for the Mayor's Welfare Fund, which will grow in need and demand. And currently, just having money sitting in a bank getting very little interest is not really a very sensible use of that resource. So I welcome this and support it. Thank you. Um, a sustainable approach would definitely suggest considering investing this for the long-term benefit of the fund um, rather than simply distributing as grants at the current time, although I accept and respect the comments made by Anne around the tension that definitely does exist there, and I think it's important that we keep the distribution option alive to consider once we've got this um, report back. Um, a sensible approach would be to consider all reasonable and viable investment options, which should, in my view, consider investing in social housing if that is a, a secure 
investment with reasonable returns, and I'm sure that's something that will be considered. Um, the key is that this is about investing sensibly for the long-term benefit of the fund. If there can be a follow-on benefit for social housing that delivers additional social outcomes, then um, that's something that I certainly would welcome. I think it's important to note that this report and the recommendation is simply asking for the investigation to be done. We're not making an investment decision today. Um, I welcome the um, results of the investigation coming back to us so that we can look at all of the options that that um, puts in front of us so that we can then choose to invest for the benefit of the fund and so that the great work that the um, Mayor's Welfare Fund is able to bring about is able to continue. Thank you. Anyone further? No, in that case I'll put the recommendations. All those in favour please say aye. Aye. Any against? No. Declare that carried. Thank you very much. Thanks Sam. Next we move to the Heritage Incentive Grant um, for 5 Shelley Street in Sydenham. So welcome Brendan. The first of um, three of these today. And if you could give us just a short summary and we'll move to questions. Yeah, Victoria's just nipped to the loose, she'll be in, in, in two ticks just to um, <laughs> cover this one because this was her report. Um, and I think there are some specific things she wants to just make sure that you're aware of, so okay. you can just bear with us for that. Apologies. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, would you like to move to the next report, the Dorset Street Plates? Um, yeah, that, that. We'll do that one. Yeah, okay. we can do that one. Thank yeah. you. Move to Dorset Street Plates, paper 10. Um, and if it just gives a quick summary and then we'll move to questions. Yeah, so I think Amanda's here um, for this one. Um, this is the, the Miles Warren designed um, series of, of apartments at Dorset Street. Um, pretty groundbreaking for its time and um, very much a, 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 a nationally and internationally recognised piece of architecture um, which um, has been um, severely damaged in the earthquakes but the owners have clubbed together, which is um, quite difficult when you imagine you've got eight different owners here that, that they all have to resolve their own in insurance issues and come together and decide to repair the building or, or not. And in this case, they've obviously decided to, to do that. So um, it's, it should be a good outcome. The repair work has, has started because they've had to proceed with some of the, um, some of the, the, the work um, to get on with it, so um, it's a um, it's a show that they've got faith in in the in the outcome of the the project. Um, anything else to add? To? No, I think we've covered it all. Yep. Nothing yep. there. Okay. So Any um, questions for Amanda or um, Brendan? Sam. Yeah, thank you. And I, I've probably missed it in the report, but are, are they currently occupied? Oh no. So they haven't been used since the earthquakes. No, they're they're, they're significantly damaged, so yeah. they've had to they've had to move out. Right. Okay. So they haven't been used since the earthquakes. No, but they have been secured. That's the important yep. thing. They were they were boxed okay. up, plywooded, and protected. And what's the intention? So they get repaired. Are they going to be owner occupied again, or will they be? Yeah. So they'll all be owner occupied. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So they're going to sell some because it's got a few of them own a couple of flats each. Um, I think some of them some of them own. Two, two flats. Yep. <laughs> it's odd that the model actually was, was uh, in the initial model was to, to have an owner who leased out another flat. So there were the, that was the, the initial design model that, by Miles Warren. That they, they knew that they could, they could see, sort of self-support their existence by having the one <laughs> that they rented out. So that was the model. Now, I know things have moved on since then, but um, other, other people do own, yes, there are a couple of owners who own couple of, of, of the units yeah but they're they, they have to work together to, to fix them anyway because the see, sorry it's, it'd be me not understanding you, you're explaining it really well but the so the people that own them now are they going to go and live in them after well um, yeah, um, I don't have that information some some of them will be owner occupied I think some will continue to be rented out right yeah well, the important um, thing is they will be fixed there, right. are, there okay. are some owners who own multiple flats, and that, that's been a, a mechanism to, to help save the buildings because some of the owners have had to sell due to right. lack of finances. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Pauline? Yeah. So 
Yes, the total cost of conservation yeah. works. And so does that include It's a tricky one yeah. because the, the, the code at the time when these were built back in the 1950s, early 60s, they, there was no insulation in them. Um, they're very small units, so the, the, the logical way that you would, you would insulate these would be to strap and line them internally. Now, that would do two things. One, it would reduce the, the size of the, the unit, but also it would cover over the, the, the fabric, and it's that exposure of the construction fabric which is important. So, yes, in some degrees, that, that they're going to have to accept that these are always going to be uninsulated buildings. Because if, if you do try and insulate them, you can insulate the roof, you can insulate the elements where you can hide the insulation, but to insulate the walls would be to hide the, the original heritage fabric. Luckily, the, the, other, the other positive thing is because the party walls, um, they're, they're like terraced houses, they don't, they don't lose heat as much because they've got a party wall as opposed to the end wall. Uh, double glazing, that's, a, that's a, a bit of a tricky one because double glazing does mean you have to change the original. Um, yeah, um, I think where, where it can be done without, without a loss of heritage values, then, then we, we would encourage people to do that. But obviously if there's, if there's existing windows and they're perfectly fine, then, then it's, it's, it doesn't make sense to pull them out just to... to, to Right. Won't there be a time when this, this sort of building will be uninhabitable because it won't um, comply with the health standards? Well, my house is 1870, so I, I'm still living in it. Um, I think I think you 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 adjust and you make you make um, provision for it. Yes, you may. Yes, have but to we spend can't here, more. and the thing is, this is council money that we're having being asked to put into it. I mean, I fully support it, but I'm just concerned that with this, it's an old cold, and our moral duty to actually be yes, help. Yeah, Carolyn, can you turn your mic on? I think it's more than building code because we've, if, if some of it's going to be rentals, there's rental standards and those kind of things yes, for insulation exactly. and healthy so, homes so and I stuff. Think, I think that, um, so, but that's for the landlord to, um, it's landlords who have to, um, who have to comply with the legislation around rental standards. But, um, but insulation and double glazing are, are, are building code requirements, so I'm assuming that the project manager and the owners have sought advice from council around um, around what they require to do to, to comply with building code. Um, I, um, the, I guess the, what we've got before you today is around the heritage fabric. Um, and I think that your question around the future, um, I, I, it's useful to reflect how technology is catching up on insulation and what you can achieve. So um, what might be possible in the future for these buildings to meet building code and still be heritage buildings or, or still retain the heritage fabric? Um, might be possible. We, we can't anticipate. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... OK, thank you. Um, any further questions? Oh, sorry, Jake, then Phil, then Tim. OK, quick one. Um, what would be the consequence of not funding these today, but the work's already happening, would work stop, would work be reduced, what, what would be the consequence? Hmm. Well, um, they, would, they would struggle to, to complete the work, yes. Um, they've, they've had to settle with their insurance companies, there is, there is a gap, there is a funding gap, so they are seeking ways to fulfil that gap. Um, ways to, to bridge the gap, sorry. So it, it would potentially, I mean, I, I can't speak for the individual owners, but um, it certainly could jeopardise the work. But we don't know the individual finances of each owner. We, we're judging it on the merits of the, the heritage values that are being retained. Thanks. Um, did you want to yell it as you go? Just one as I walk out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
Well, it, it, it has high heritage values, so that, that's, that's Thanks, why they, they have faith in it as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Tim. Um, so there are eight of them, and the, is it that two are connected? And so there's a kind of separate. So I'm just wondering if it's heritage value that we're after. Do we need to support all eight, or is it if we're after heritage value to protect then a unit, the two units? I think, I think although this, there are two, there are two separate blocks. There, they are very much linked. If, if you if you lose one, it's it's it will lose a lot of the value. I mean that they were originally designed as eight units for. I mean they they were bachelor. It's kind of slightly two different things, though, aren't they? Because yeah. one is we, 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 our, our, we're debating here about the heritage value of a building yeah. or buildings, yeah. but the other one is the social value of what they were trying to achieve back then. Yeah. So there are two different things here, but the fund is about the architectural fabric of the building. Yeah, but, but there are. It, w it would be difficult to decide, for example, which of the four you would keep. You would then be telling four owners that you're not getting funding but you are how, how would you do that they, they do have they have value as they are now they've they've actually um, survived for 50 years without huge alteration um, they they are a a, a an entity mm. you know, to, to, to lose half of it would be a significant loss you'd, and undermine the heritage you'd values you'd reduce the architectural values quite quite a lot okay yeah, yeah. I know that there does seem to be some repetition in them, but, but, but that's, that's the point of them. They were, they were eight units pretty much the same, with, with modifications made on the, on the basis of, of uh, what the owners were able to do or wanted to do with them. So, mm. yeah, I think it would, be, it would undermine the heritage values of the, of the, 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 the item to lose half of it. They okay. are listed as one item. Thank you. Brenda, can I just check the, um, the amount that's recommended? Um, while it's a sort of certain percentage of the, the works proposed, uh, per unit it's quite a bit higher than we would normally do for um, dwellings of, this, um, of each individual size. And I was wondering if you've got any comments on that. So maybe twice as high as um, individual dwellings of that size that we've done in the past? Yeah. Well, the the individual unit is, is works out at forty five thousand dollars per unit. Um, I, I, I didn't I, that didn't strike me as being a, a large amount. We we actually re, re, reduced the percentage. You see, the percentage has gone down to twenty five percent. So it, it it could have been more than that. But that seemed to be um, an appropriate figure. Um, other comparisons we did where where funding was. Um, um, it is difficult to do comparisons with different types of building because we're dealing with, with a, a, a modernist um, concrete block building here as opposed to a timber frame building. Um, and also the, the need to, to have cross-party uh, cooperation in order to strengthen walls, for example, that are party walls. So it seemed the figure was arrived at on the basis of one, what, all of the criteria that we, we use, but... but Amongst them is obviously the, the heritage value of the building, what the owners can contribute, but also what funding is available. And the total funding at, at 360,000 seemed to be um, the right the right area. It gives a a reasonably significant amount of support to individual owners, but not not excessive. So can I just clarify though, if there had been less funding available before the end of the financial year? You would have been happy to recommend less. Well, we have to. We have to bear in mind what funds we have available to, yeah. to come up with a with a with a figure, um, and and the figure is either uh, is based on a percentage or or or, or a more um, nominal figure to, to show support for something of of, of this kind of um, of this kind of work. So. Um, I mean, we yeah. particularly had in mind the, the fact that it's an 183,000 gap for each flat between the um, insurance payout and the actual costs of the heritage works. Um, so it's a sig it is a significant gap, um, which that, that 
25 per cent will, will go towards and helping. And we referred back to other um, buildings such as the, the Duncan's buildings, yeah. which was a, a row of buildings in High Street that we made a contribu contribution to. Yeah, and they um, got $45,000 each as well. So that, I mean, that's a, 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 a comparable grant sum. And, and you've got to remember as well, we, we're excluding those elements where the owners have chosen to upgrade things like kitchens that you know they're not they're not heritage so these this is the this is the the bones of the building that we're supporting here so they are having to invest further sums themselves if they want to to increase the 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 level of amenity in the in the unit thanks um mike thanks the funding gap because of the insurance is because the the owners are choosing to um upgrade it from 34 percent which they got um settled for up to 67. 67, yes. Yeah. So that's a, I guess that's a choice of them to do. Mm -hmm. It is a choice, but, but it, it gives them that resilience to, to that, that if the code changes slightly, you won't get caught and become an earthquake-prone building. Sam. Sorry, just one last quick one. It's just to follow up what I was saying before. So do, do we have a sense of the intention of these buildings once they are repaired? Uh, I'm just not... I can't, I can't find out here, are they going to be built and then on sold? Are they going to be built, rented out? Are they going to be built or are they all being moved into by the owners? Did, have you talked through that in your discussions with them? No, it's not a conversation I've had. Um, I guess the important thing for us is that they'll continue to be used for, for residential <coughs> purposes yep. as they were originally so built. The important thing for us is that they'll continue to be used for residential purposes. So that's that, that's been our main concern. Um, they have a history of being owner occupied or rented out. As far as I know, that's going to continue. Okay. Yep, James. Uh, look, what Councillor Major said, I'm, I feel similarly. Um, However, I recognise that there are heritage values, but how many of these do we have on our books? Of, of this, this, um... of this sort of nature, because you know I, I know those flats. I used to party in them, but um, uh, but you know where, where does it well, end? That, well, we can. We... What we're looking at is the heritage values. The, these are these are the first, the first of their type. They're, they're the prototype designed by oh, one well, of the. Yeah. the, 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 the sorry, when I say on our books, on our on our as a response register, that's a word, yeah. Well, they're on the district plan um, list of, of heritage buildings. Well, we don't have anything else. We don't have anything else like these on on the schedule in the district plan. Um, in terms of modernist post-war buildings, um, it, it, okay. we have yeah. a handful. Okay. The Town Hall, um, Sir Miles Warren's office and flat in Cambridge Terrace is, is similar, but this, you know, this building's of New Zealand architectural significance in terms of the story of how our architecture developed. Well, I'm not being flippant when I say, yeah, and there are similar, and maybe they're following, he was following um, Miles Warren, um, on the corner of Andover and Cheltenham, and they just got redone up. I used to live there, and they were by um, oh god, what's the other Peter Bevan, I think, and they're similar, you know. Um, so that was why I asked how many were on the register here, yeah. mm. and I know that they're in the district plan. Thanks. Anne, we are. Um, I'm, I wanted to follow on a little bit from your comments about um, Sir Miles Warren and how significant um, this is for us as a city, given that we're growing our reputation as being internationally a really interesting place to be, uh, for people to come um, and, and view our architecture. How important is Sir Miles Warren to our city and to our nation? Um, well... Yeah, from an architectural perspective, he, he is hugely important. Um, the, these flats are, were a pivotal work, a, a turning point, if you like. Um, I think he'd just come, he'd come back from England. Um, he had these new ideas about styles, materials, use of concrete. Um, and it, so he, he put those to use in, 
little old Christchurch. Um, and it can be seen as a turning point, I guess, in the, at the start of the development of the Christchurch modernist style, which is our familiar concrete, you know, white painted concrete block buildings, which unfortunately we've, we've lost a lot of those as a result of the earthquakes. But um, this, you know, it really is a key, a, a key stone point in the, at the development of Christchurch and New Zealand architecture. And, and they're probably fundamental in, in Miles Warren's career. Without this sort of uh, starting point, every architect of, 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 of significance needs to, to get off the mark. And these were some of those buildings which allowed him to, to, to then proceed to, to bigger things. Without these small steps at the start, there wouldn't be a, a, a Warren and Marnie, potentially. So, I think we need to move on a little bit. So it's, it's clear that they have high heritage value, but the room seems to have some disquiet over the um, the amount being um, recommended today. So at this point, do we have a mover for the staff recommendation or for a different amount? So staff recommendation, Jake, um, and Melanie, second. Okay. Um, we will indeed. Um, I'm just, just checking the room at this stage to see if there's anything, any further questions or first, yeah, sorry, checking for foreshadowed or... I'm, I'm happy to foreshadow that we decline the grant. So. Well, I mean, we wouldn't need to foreshadow that, we'd just vote against it. Yeah, well, that's just signal to the room. Just whether there was a foreshadowed... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just whether there was a foreshadowed motion um, for a different amount, if anyone was wanting to do that. Okay. Um, okay, in that case... Jake will start. Yeah, um, yeah I, I guess as the local councillor for this area, I just wanted to set a scene of, of where these flats are located. They're in a um, really unique part of our city, that residential CBD that has a huge amount of history, uh, not just both built, but also um, cultural history in that area as well. And, and um, I, I know uh, better than anyone how, how uh, badly these areas have been affected by, by um, high density. Uh, un you know, Poorly thought out and and um, you know rubbish buildings, um, <laughs> which I yeah, um, and I, I guess I also thought this is again a prime piece of CBD real estate that um, is, is it's sitting on valuable land and the owners would have absolutely been better to to bowl these and and, and put up something less um, less sympathetic to the area. So I think we should we should be mindful of that when. Um, when deciding on this. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you. Just to kick off, um, it was Warren and Marnie. So um, Morris Marnie was absolutely a genius. And if you've seen his hand-drawn pictures and designs for the town hall, not through CAD, but hand-drawn, he was an absolute genius. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, I love the irony of this. The um, Dorset Street flats were described as the ugliest buildings in Christchurch, just want to remind you. And with regards to size, um, if you look at some of the flats that are exorbitant prices at the moment, and one can debate their quality, um, at 600000 and 450000 etc., I think these are a bargain, to be quite honest. And if you look at the land values that the neighbours have been trying to sell one of those places at um, a number of million, um, I think that... Um, it's important heritage to keep because they could be bold because the land value, as Jake has described, per square metre is, I think, well and truly absorbent. But never mind all that. What we're here today is discuss the value of the architecture. That's what we're here to protect. Um, I'm no um, architect and I'm no historian, so I will go on this, the um, recommendations of the, the staff. I, I do debate sometimes about the quality, but it is like art. And the mm -hmm. irony I love is all the discussion with regards to intensity of intensification, etc., in our city, and the questions on um, architectural value, etc. This is the wonderful thing that they were described as the ugliest buildings in Christchurch, and they are now um, listed as New Zealand uh, um, landmark heritage site of buildings. So um, I think it's a, a wonderful irony and I'll be supporting staff. Thank you, Sam. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. As sort of uh, mentioned earlier on, uh, by <laughs> sort of signalling potentially a foreshadow, I won't be supporting this in its current form. And it's not because I don't value heritage in the city. I think that's really important to clarify. Um, but it's a question of priorities across the city at the moment. And this is a significant amount of money uh, that is going into these uh, these block of flats, effectively, or th these units. Um, probably there's two things that stood out. The first one was around, I think, your questions, Sarah, which are very, very good in terms of the budget allocation um, and the need for that being changed over time. And you know, the answers with respect, I don't think we need to be um, going down a line of because there's money in a budget, we should therefore spend it. Um, you know, it does become frustrating because it becomes a constant excuse uh, or I guess a reason to drive a value. Um, but when we're making real sacrifices in the city at the moment, you know, we're having to stop um, unless it gets changed in the LTP, that mobile library van, um, you know, which costs a fraction of this and a, and a range of other issues uh, that you know, we have to make some real sacrifices. So I would just hate to get to a point where these get rebuilt, repaired, and then potentially, given the market movement, have on sold and effectively the ratepayers have footed the bill for that. Um, I'm not sure that would be a wise investment for the ratepayer. So I would urge colleagues um, to potentially not support this today um, while still acknowledging the importance heritage plays in our city. Thanks, Anne. Thank you. Um, I think the ratepayers will be paying, uh, will be investing in heritage, and um, Sir Miles Warren has been described as the doyen of post. Um, uh, well, he's, he describes the first New Zealand to be knighted for services to architecture, and really Christchurch is is Sir Miles Warren's place and known for that. And this is something to celebrate and to treasure. And so um, this is about. Putting a we can't put a value on these things, an economic value. This is important for us as a city, for us as our identity. So I will be supporting the staff recommendations today. Thank you. Mike, and then Melanie. Thanks. I'm unsure if actually some of my colleagues have read the report. This building is currently being repaired. It is not getting demolished. Um, this decision is whether we actually contribute um, to how much these private owners are going to pay to um, to build them, and the reason why it's actually um, above the insurance settlement is because they're increasing the NPS. So um, I'll actually be agreeing with Sam and will not be um, saying yes to this. Thank you. Um, Melanie. Um, these are category one listed heritage buildings. So I, in my opinion, if anyone won't support um, putting money towards these, they shouldn't be supporting any heritage in our city really, because that's clearly the view that they're taking. And it would be good to have more housing available once um, once they're completed. So, um, you know, win-win. Um, any further debate? Oh. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, look, to me, here, it, uh, notwithstanding its, um, what is it, level one, um, class one heritage, what, it's like art to me. You know, what's heritage to someone is not necessarily heritage to me, and my heritage can often not be heritage to anyone else. Mm -hmm. So it's subjective to me, as is art. Um, I, I appreciate the reminder that <laughs> it has been called the ugliest building in the city, and um, but it was still good to party in, I have to say. <laughs> but on a serious note, in, you know, I'm struggling with this full stop. Um, and I think that Councillor MacDonald made a very good point, notwithstanding why we're even talking about this uh, through policies and, and so on. The principle is that the mobile libraries, which I'd never use in a month of Sundays, but that is important to the ratepayers and residents of the city. And that's what, $91,000, I think it was. Well. That's crazy that we say no to that and yes to this. So that's why I'm saying no to this. Um, Aaron? It's been an interesting debate today, um, especially around people's taste in architecture. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and it's correct, it is in the eye of the beholder. Um, I do uh, appreciate the value of these to the city. Um, I would have preferred the quantum of the grant was smaller and, uh, and on Mike's point that they hadn't gone so high on the NBS and they'd stuck with the 34 because it would be um, considerably different. Uh, it did say in the report because they're waiting on uh, the seismic strengthenings for the um, next event. Um, given how often the events come, uh, then you, 
and I know the Alpine fault, 75% due within a 50 year period, so on and so forth. Um, but if you do the math, you'd actually go with um, the 34 and, uh, and just repair again if you had to. Uh, so I, and people would have been safe. So I um, agree with Mike on that one. And so I would have supported a smaller amount, but not this amount. Karen, would you like to foreshadow a motion for a smaller amount? What would that amount be? Up to you. Hasn't he already spoken that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I would be interested to hear if someone else foreshadows a smaller amount. Thank Madam you. Chair. Yep. Pauline. Yeah, thank you. I'm also quite struggling with this one, um, but I don't think comparing apples with pears like mobile libraries with a heritage fund is particularly helpful here. We have a heritage fund that we've set up because we... Um, are passionate and committed to re retaining and repairing the heritage that we have left, the little heritage that we have left as a result of our earthquake events. Um, look, I'm happy to take staff advice on this because you are all over the heritage in our city. They've come to you for this. You're recommending it. So on this occasion, because I'm not an expert on this, I'm happy to take staff guidance on this and, um, and support it, particularly in the light of the information that we know that this is a renowned building throughout New Zealand. So I think it's in our interest to retain it. So in, in, in light of that, I'm going to support this today. Thanks, Pauline. Um, and I think I'd like to add as well that, um, you know, I think that we have a fund which as councillors we signed off on in the annual plan last year and we signed off a, a certain amount that could be spent up to, you don't have to spend it all, absolutely. Um, but we also opened applications and I think that if someone with a category one building who has applied for this fund doesn't qualify, uh, I think we really need to seriously relook at the fund. Um, and when it comes to the, the mobile library, let's remember that as councillors we agreed um, during the uh, long-term plan process to propose that that um, be closed at the same time as signing off on a proposal that left heritage funding there. So I think that's a decision for a future discussion over the LTP after submissions. Um, these are Category 1 um, buildings and I'm happy to support um, some funding for them today. Like Aaron, I'm a bit concerned about the amount um, and so I'd like to foreshadow a motion um, of 240,000, which is 30,000 each, um, uh, should this uh, resolution fail. Uh, Yanni. I want to check with staff, sorry, I'm just out of a proposal to reduce their quantum, but there's a equip grant. Is that um, only paid out if it's matched by the local authority? Uh, no. That grant's independent of? It's totally independent, oh, yeah. um, and it's only for two of the flats, which had an even lower insurance settlement than, okay. than they cool. made. And just, um, if we go down to 240 or, or 200, this would still qualify for a full covenant? We're in debate. Yeah. So, well, you've, you've foreshadowed okay. a thing. Yeah, but, so. we, but if we get, okay, so in it's that case, we how do I need to clarify. On yep. Okay. Yeah. So the, the um, covenant would still be in place? Just to clarify, uh, Brendan, with a lower the, grant? The, the covenant, the covenant um, yes, the, the covenant comes in at 15,000. Yep. So it's a limited covenant. Yeah. Right, and Yanni, sorry, do you want to get back to your debate? Uh, oh, sorry. I, I thought um, if it was over 150,000, it was a full covenant. That's right. The, the, there is a difference. The, there's, the, there's a limited covenant, which is between 15 and 150, and then once you're over 150, then it becomes a full covenant. Right. Full covenant is in perpetuity, um, yeah. and has has more um, constraints within the document. It's a it's a more. Um, yeah. But the key question is, with serious foreshadowed quantum, the full covenant would still be able to be put on this property. Full yes. covenant on, only only if the owners are are, are accepting of that. There is no okay. there is no requirement in the grant criteria yes. to have a full covenant below that figure. Okay. What, you only you only you only go to that full covenant once you get a grant of over 150,000. Yeah. Okay. So any debate, Yanni? Oh, I think, um, you know, I, I support heritage in our city and I, I appreciate the significance of these buildings, but I think the other thing that we also need to be mindful of 
is actually we've got a number of heritage items in our city, so I am concerned about the quantum of the grant, and I would prefer a reduction. Um, so I'd prefer to support the foreshadowed um, amendment rather than the substantive, because we've got so many other priorities for heritage in our city as well. We just heard from um, a group this morning. Yeah, thank you. Um, any further debate? Jake, would you like to close? No? No, oh, Jimmy? Because originally I'm reluctant to debate, but now I'm still concerned the amount of the, the, the funding, you know, because why? If they go with the insurance, they full cover $1.5 million, but they want to upgrade upgrade uh, from the 34 percentage MPS to the 67, then have a show for the $1.4 million. So actually this, you know, when they request, we go and find in 25 percentage, but the amount is still quite a lot, particularly compared to previous one, maybe Lex one, you know, it's a 366 the case, still a big amount. But your full cover, we don't need to grant anyone. So I, I'm still concerned <laughs> this amount. Is, I like to foreshadow, you know, can minimize. I would like to go to the either Yanni or Sevas one, two two hundred K or two forty, because three hundred sixty six K is still a big amount from repair. I think it's unfair to lose those the repair. Thank you very much. If there's no further debate, I'll put the um, staff recommendation. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against? No. no. I declare that lost. Um, and we'll move to the. Well, it's it's lost, and we move to the next one. Oh, sorry. It's yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not used to those. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so move to the um, uh, foreshadowed motion, which is the same except for the the dollar amount. Um, it's two hundred and forty thousand, which makes them thirty thousand each. And I don't think we need any more debate on that one. <laughs> um, do I have a seconder for that, though? Jake, thank you. So that's me and Jake. Can Jake do oh, I can't. Oh, no, you can't. No, no, you can't move an amendment. You can't do an amendment. This is a different motion. Yeah. It's a new, mo new motion altogether. So Jake's fine, yeah. Um, right, in that case, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Any against? No, no. Uh, division. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Chin? Yes. Councillor Chu? No. Councillor Coker? Yes. Councillor Cotter? Yes. Councillor Daniels? No. Councillor Davidson? No. Councillor Galloway? Yes. Councillor Goff? No. Councillor Johansson? Councillor Kewan? Yes. Councillor McDonald? No. Councillor McClellan? No. Councillor Scandrift? No. Is that no? No. Councillor Templeton? Aye. Eight in favour and six against. Declare that carried. Thank you very much. Okay, and now we move back to uh, the Heritage Incentive Grant for 5 Shelley Street. <laughs> Welcome, Victoria. Right, um, thank you very much. So we'll the next one here. Um, so if you'd like to just give us a quick summary and then we'll go to questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, big one to follow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm here with a report in front of you um, that recommends the committee supports the retention of the Little Brick Cottage at 5 Shelley Street by approving a Heritage Incentive Grant Fund for maintenance works to keep the building weathertight and in constant use. Um, this little brick cottage is a very prominent key feature in the local landscape. It's part of the identity of the neighbourhood. It's also very important contextually because it tells the story of the development of Sydenham, specifically of Shelley Street's creation and its uh, development into a residential suburb. 
the owner of the cottage has spent the last 10 years plus out of the building fighting with her insurance company trying to get a decent insurance payment um, rather than have it as an insurance write-off. She has now got a settlement in place and the works have begun, but she's been left with certain elements that didn't get funded, which were considered to be pre-existing damage. That was um, rotten timber work and joinery to the back of the building, defective weatherproofing and flashings, and the need for a new roof. And she's come to request an incentive grant to help support those works that weren't covered by the earthquake funding. That's great, thank you very much. Do we have any questions on this one? No questions? Okay, then do I have a mover? Tim? Second that, Melanie? Um, any debate? No, those in favour please say aye. Aye. Those against? Declare that carried, thank you very much. <laughs> that was really interesting. <laughs> Oh, it's braced there. <laughs> yeah, okay, and so we'll move to um, the 10 Britain Street. Okay. Um, so back to Amanda. All right, we're just swapping seats now, then I'll be back after this. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so a quick summary again and then move to questions. Sure. Um, so this, this is a building which is not scheduled in the district plan. Um, but it does have um, historical, social and architectural significance. It's a landmark in Linwood, really because of its location on a sand hill and with its um, landscaping of um, concrete walls and steps. Um, the house needs re-leveling and maintenance and repair work. The current owner purchased it last year and um, didn't receive any insurance money for those earthquake works so um, this grant uh, she's looking to um, have some assistance with those costs that she's taken on by taking on this building which she wants to retain for its okay. values. Thank you very much. Melanie you have a question? Um, yeah, my question was just why um, is it not listed in the um, district plan as a heritage building? Uh, well, it, it quite possibly would meet the threshold. Um, based on the initial research and assessment we've done, it, it could well do. There are potentially hundreds of buildings w which aren't on the schedule yet, but which meet the threshold. We just haven't had time to research and assess all of those yet. So there are many more possibilities out there. Thank you. Tim? Um, the, the current owner purchased this as is whereas it was advertised as is whereas, is that correct? I'm not sure if it was advertised as is whereas, but that, that was the circumstances that she So it was brought in as is whereas, mm -hmm. thank you. Any further questions? Mike. The, the cost estimate in there to, to repair at 130,000, is that everything that needs to be done to the house and then it's up to, I guess, an insurable, livable standard? Uh, yes, as far as I know. Yep. Okay. 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 Any further questions? No? In that case, I have Jake as mover. Do I have a second on Melanie? Um, debate. Tim. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is, I think, very different to the... <coughs> to the previous one, whereas the previous one was a, um, a, a, a recognised heritage building. This isn't. It was bought, one would presume, cheaper than um, standard market rate under as is where is. And um, generally when you walk through a house that needs re-levelling, piling and foundations, you're pretty well aware of it. I certainly was aware of mine. Um, there are, I, would, um, I can't support this. I think that um, this is one for that the owner bought with your eyes open and um, we should be preserving the money for heritage for recognised heritage buildings. Thank you. Melanie? Um, I will obviously be supporting this. Um, it's um, it, Just because it hasn't been recognised in the district plan doesn't mean it doesn't meet the threshold, it just means that the work hasn't been done yet to put it there. Um, so, um, And I think this one has a lot more heritage value um, than the Category 1 Dorset Street that I supported as well. So um, I, I think this is not a lot of money and um, it's 
you can see from looking at the building, it's clearly got heritage value and based on what's in our report. Thank you. Any further debate? Tammy, sorry. Yep. Thanks. Uh, just briefly, look, this isn't a, a listed heritage building. Uh, my view is that there needs to be a line in the sand. If it's not on the register, then I find it hard to justify it, especially when there are some on the register that very narrowly only scrape through. So no support from me. Thank you. Any further debate? No, in that case, oh, Mike. So I was going to echo what Tim said. I have concern when, um, you know, we have applications from people that buy properties um, at a very um, low rate because they're as is, where is, um, and then come to council with with their hand out to help um, do them up. Pauline, and, oh, so yeah, yeah, I think that's a valid point, but I don't agree the thing is that someone could buy that, say, OK, I could pay that for that and apply for a council grant and I could save the building. So I'm going to support this. Thank you. James? Just trying to think that through. Um, <laughs> the end of the day, the building is saved. Yeah, I got that bit. Um, cool. <laughs> I think it's a valid point and therefore I'm uh, not going to be supporting <laughs> this recommendation. OK, is there any further debate around the table? No? OK, in that case, um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Those against? No. Division? Yeah. On the street. Councillor Tableton? Aye. Councillor McClellan? Councillor McDonald? No. Councillor Johansson? No. Councillor Galloway? Yes. Councillor Daniels? No. no. Councillor Coker? Yes. Councillor Chen? No. Councillor Scandrit? No. Councillor Kewan? Yes, I see that. That's great. Thank you very much. I declare that lost. Okay. Um, we'll now move on to the Intangible Heritage Grant application for Teputahi Architectural Audio Tour. Welcome back, Victoria. If you could give us a quick summary, then we'll move to questions. Thank you. Um, this is the first of the intangible heritage grants from the new scheme that you established for us in the annual plan. Um, I've put down a recommendation that the committee support the creation of a digital architectural tour of our city by approving this grant. The grant will allow um, um, Te Putahi to develop a free-to-use, accessible and innovative new approach to showcasing and publicising our heritage in an exciting and engaging way so that the stories of the buildings and the parts of the city that have got significance now and for the future can be shared as the unique Tonga that they are. The $30,000 grant will provide a tour on an app of 10 key landmark buildings across the city. Some are recognised as heritage items they're in the district plan some aren't places like our new wonderful library isn't necessarily in the plan but it's still an important part of our architectural heritage and the stories that sit behind that building and why and how it was created are just as valuable to capture now for the future so it's looking at heritage as it was but also the future heritage that is to come locals and visitors will be able to access this and engage more with the heritage of the city and the stories and the diversity of those stories that are such a part of Christchurch City. Um, the other thing to remember with it is that it is the first of this type of tour. The applicants have also said that they will be offering it up for free to use. It will be provided on a Creative Commons licence, which means that it will go to our libraries. And I was talking 
this morning to our libraries about it, it will go into the Canterbury Stories, into our digital repository there, and then it can be accessed by anybody through the library system. It can be added to the information that's on the Gibson wall as part of that. And also, as a prototype, other groups can come along and follow this model and make their own tours. So we have a group in Wollstone who are looking at doing a wonderful Wollstone tour. They've identified places. They can use this as a model or a template to gather their stories and pull them together. Um, I was at a community board meeting where there was a group looking at trying to do the same um, around Wooden Park and gather stories based on Wooden Park and places around there. They'll also be able to take this as a model and a prototype and then build on it. So this money is for these 10 items, but it is also creating a wider prototype for other groups to feed into and use as a model. That's great. Thank you very much. Any questions? <coughs> Sam. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a tough one because I do I like the concept. I'm just trying to work out why. Like how many how many heritage staff would we have in it? I don't. It might be a question for Mary potentially, but in the heritage team here at council. Six. 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 Yeah, okay. And how many would be in our comms team? Do you think? About forty nine. About forty nine. Mm. Yeah. So why wouldn't we with a concept like this? Because I, I do like it. Why wouldn't we just do it in house? Because I see Christchurch NZ are involved as well. Why would we? grant money when we've got teams that, that know about this stuff? Um, a large portion of this is actually going to the people who will be doing the oral histories, the recording, the editing, the story gathering and the research gathering. They'll be going out to the um, open, open um, Christchurch Festival and interviewing people there. It's not something that sits traditionally within our role. Our role is to facilitate communities, groups, organisations to develop this kind of thing. It's not something the council has ever really done themselves. We've been more of a facilitator. So has there been any consideration as to why we wouldn't do it? I'm just thinking economies of scale, because I like the concept of, you know, talking about doing it in Wollstone and, and the likes with different things. Mm -hmm. If we've got a model that works, surely we, we must be able to get something in-house that makes it far more efficient and far more effective than having to grant money for these so, types of things. I think we've got Carolyn who might be able to give a short answer. Uh, so Open Christchurch is a privately um, is a, a privately a private initiative and um, they are Teputahi are um, as the um, Christchurch Centre for Architecture are advancing that. They are um, so they are arranging all of the um, all of the, the buildings that are open, all of the insurance access, all of the detail around that. This is one component of that um, that um, that they've decided that they want to add this to their um, to their offering for that program. It it, hap it also happens that it can have a longer life. Um, I guess that staff have approached this on the basis that. Um, that council have signalled that they want to engage the community in looking at intangible heritage fund uh, funding um, to enable us to start to acknowledge and um, encourage community groups to look at stories um, and, um, and I guess further information ar around the city of Christchurch that doesn't rely on the resources of council all the time. So that's um, that's why this is not um, not something that um, I've encouraged um, to be an internal um, thing. I I I think that um, well I've perhaps wrongly read the cue that council would like community groups to pick up such initiatives and yeah. um, take them forward. I think that one of the things is that it's in the um, the heritage strategy. But Carolyn, I think the, the one of the questions is from based on Sam's. This particular piece of work, if council chose to use council resources to do it, if there were available resources, could we do it for a, a, a lower price, I guess is what your question is, yeah. um, given the number of volunteer hours and stuff. So that um, having looked at, at the um, at, um, work that Te Putahi have done um, in other, I guess in other sectors, and in, in, um, uh, in some of the, um, the placemaking work, they are very cost effective, and I doubt, I, I don't think that we would necessarily be able to achieve the same outcome. Well, that's, that's very alarming. Pardon? That's very alarming. If, 
if we can't do that internally. Well, we don't, we don't use volunteer hours as, as probably the main thing. No, no, thing. but you look at the... We don't do volunteer hours. No, no, com completely hours. get that, but there's a lot of costs in here that I would have thought we already have within our organisation. So if, if we can't do it for the same or if not less, that's... Anyway, sorry, that's okay, my question. So, yeah. Okay, there were just any further questions? No, in that case, um, do I have a mover for this one? Um, Melanie this time. <laughs> and seconder, um, Mike. Uh, do we have any discussion? Jamie. Jamie. Briefly. Um, look, the ratepayers have already paid for saving a number of key heritage buildings in this city, and, and I don't think they need to be up for it again uh, to partially fund storytelling audio for, for them. Um, Look, the app could even be a 99 cent or uh, a pay pay app if people have a smartphone. So, um, look, I think again, you, you you need to make a call of where it stops. So, um, I, I'm not supportive of this. Tim, um, look, I hope there would be some vision in the future with regards to this type of thing, where we have um, the um, art gallery, museum, and ourselves involved, so you can um, um, look at. Um, the, what the Gap Filler have done, and write the whole story of Christchurch, the artworks that we have, etc. So I think this is a start, but I think we could do so much more. And whether we do it, and I'd take Sam's point that it would be really good to have partners and others that could pay for it and um, enhance the city, because I think this is a really good start to what could be. Sam? Yeah, I won't be supporting it. I mean, the 30, a $30,000 grant, along with the in-kind from the likes of Christchurch NZ, I think, as James said, you know, there is a constant drain on the ratepayer for a lot of this stuff. There, we, we have an organisation with thousands of staff. You cannot tell me there is not economies of scale by doing a lot of this stuff in-house. We have experts in heritage. We have a whole libraries team and a, and a comms department. If we can't facilitate a lot of this to reduce that grant, then I don't think we're doing our job properly, so I can't support it. Melanie, then Anne. Um, Look, when we looked at the heritage strategy and we, we then allowed for intangible heritage grants um, and agreed as a council that we that we would support that, it would seem strange to me that we then wouldn't go and support something that is an intangible heritage grant for telling the stories that can be done at a at a you know at a very cost effective um, way because we know that the way that these sorts of people work is very cost effective um, and they put in lots of volunteer hours and they can they will be closer to the ground um, than our heritage staff because there'll be a lot of people who'll be wanting to put these stories together um, so it's just a no-brainer and I don't think $30,000 is actually a lot of money in the scheme of things. Anne? Uh, we often, uh, whenever we have um, discussions about giving uh, funds to heritage buildings, we often talk about how do we make uh, them accessible to the residents of Christchurch who have um, contributed to them. Well, this is the way that we do this. This is uh, a perfect use of money to make these beautiful places and buildings um, accessible. People can't often go into them, but they can learn about them, and an audio tour is a perfect way for that to happen. So very supportive of this. It's a great use of, of resource developing something that is um, going to have a, a huge benefit to both um, growing awareness uh, uh, to our city residents, but also those who are visiting the, the city because of the architectural and heritage values that we have here. And Christchurch NZ and their destinations um, site talk about Christchurch as that place. So this is a way to open up that knowledge uh, to, to those visitors and to our residents. So very supportive of this. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Uh, Jimmy, that's right. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I support this one uh, because based on the staff, you can mention uh, this is the first intangible heritage grant application, and we, we review those heritage strategy. You know, particularly not only cover tangible but also intangible. Intangible actually, you know, is promote our city, particularly regarding to our stories, our the, the history, etc. But this one, the staff particularly mentioned, fit for the digital world, libraries, etc. You know, and also particularly focus on the. Those uh, kind of across uh, the whole city, you know, related to arch architecture, uh, the audio guide the app, etc. I think that's very crucial uh, for for us uh, because we have to encourage this one. This part of our uh, the, the history, part of our uh, the kind of story, we need to promote and share 
with the you know the the the, the one another. I think that's important. Thank you. Anyone else? No, I'll be supporting this today. I think one of the key things we do as a council is to try and encourage and enable um, community groups and organisations to do uh, much of the work that some people think council should do um, in the city. I think that keeping this accessible for um, everyone in the city via not just the app but via our libraries, um, making it accessible from a range of different sources is, is really important and um, with no cost attached. I think that if we were to um, start asking the organisation to pick up the work um, and the good ideas that come from our community all the time, then what we would be doing um, in the end would be asking our park staff to run our community gardens. And we'd be asking every time um, someone came up with a new idea for a, a new environmental app, we'd be saying, oh, listen, um, surely our staff could do that because we've got great staff in IT and comms. I think that enabling um, our community groups and our residents' groups to pick up this, to um, make the most of the community building that happens at the same time, to make the most of the volunteer um, time that's involved, um, is really good for the city, not just for heritage, but for a range of other things as well. So that's why I'm happy to support this today. And with that, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against? No. Would you like those recorded? Declare that carried. So, um, Councillors McDonald, Goff, and Chu, and Kewan. Against. Thank you very much. That's carried. Right, and we'll take a 15 minute break and come back at 20 past. <laughs>
Urban Regeneration Biannual Report, so October through to March this year. Thanks, Martin. I'm not, I don't have my glasses on. Is that Miranda next to you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see the I can't see anything else. Okay. Um, so welcome. Thank you very much. If you can give, um, give us a bit of a run through, that'd be great. And then we'll move into questions. Uh, kia ora. My name is Martin Kaczynski. I'm from the Urban Regeneration team. This is Miranda Charles, my colleague. And uh, we have the rest of our, our team here as well to answer any questions. Uh, so this is the Suburban Regeneration Biennial Report, looking back at the period of October to March. And um, these, just to repeat, um, these reports are looking at that period. They're not necessarily um, up to date since, uh, since March or looking forward. Um, the, this report is, uh, has been out to the community boards for comments and received no further comments. Uh, the, we've chosen to highlight in this report the progress made on the Greening the East plan in Linwood Village and um, some further work towards uh, safety strategy and uh, also reviewing some uh, post-construction um, monitoring in Sumner Village. And I uh, suppose it ends on looking uh, at the future of this report and the direction we'd like to take uh, future reporting to basically uh, follow council priorities while um, focusing mainly on projects that are, are uh, taking place in that, that particular financial year instead of our current format, which uh, looks at every single one of our master plan and other priority areas, um, even when there isn't funding or progress necessarily within that reporting period. Sorry, my hub is um, constantly failing on me. Uh, questions, Tim? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I first apologise. I can't remember this coming to our community board, so I do apologise for that. But um, I, I noticed that there's nothing with regards to the Selwyn Street shops. It's very much. So I'm just wondering, with regards to if in, if in the next report, I suppose I'll, we've got a community board briefing this afternoon, which I'll discuss with Melanie. But I just not want to really kind of wonder where that is. If, if that could be in the next report, that would be good. Oh, I can um, attempt to answer the question now, if you like. Yeah, please, yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, the Suburban Regeneration Biannual Report was released for the community boards roughly about the time that um, our omnibus briefing came around late last year. Mm. And um, at that time, we, we highlighted that the boards had been sent the report and, and the date for feedback. Uh, mm. Selwyn Street Master Plan, uh, the current project is a stormwater upgrade um, renewal project and the streetscape upgrade uh, has been phased for later in the annual plan. Yeah, I thought, so I kind of, it got split, I think, to the, um, and Melanie, you'll be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the um, landscaping has been removed and put into Naval Point, which we agree, but I, I, I slipped up there again, it's totally my bad. But the other one was out to 2027, but it is an environment that is highly stressed. So I just, yeah, because we've got the issue with NZ, uh, NZTA with Brown Street, etc., Addington School, and a number of others. So just, yeah, yeah, I think it's probably a discussion I should have with the community board. And so, so sorry. Yeah. But and thank you very much. For, for the long term plan as well. Yeah. Personally, I think it's a bit more than that. It's only discussion, yeah. Okay, more questions? Yanni. I was just interested in terms of it says that um, change requests are considered throughout the year. So, like some areas we've got, um, in, in some ways it's a shame that we don't have the list of the projects, but I know our, our community board got like a really good memo that showed a number of projects that weren't funded. Um, so, and it's got every project, so you can kind of see like in Phillipstown, for example, we haven't really done what we said we were going to do, but obviously that's because of the four laning. But what's the process to get reconsideration or recollaboration collaboration of things that um, should have been done but haven't been done for whatever reason, put into, the, into a better way of getting progress? 
Um, through the chair, a recalibration of the master plan capital program was done a couple of years ago, and uh, that those projects um, were shown in that current in that LTP at the time. Um, since that recalibration process, I think we've been through another annual plan, and um, now we're under a draft capital program. Um, in terms of prioritising projects, I think. Uh, we previously messaged the community board plan is a good way for our boards to uh, highlight their <coughs> master plan capital priorities. And in terms of how the current draft capital program is showing, um, decisions are still yet to be made, so there may still be an opportunity to uh, adjust that current view. So just looking at like the kind of progress, do you, do you see gaps along um, the, the, the master plans. Do you see some areas that haven't really had the same level of resourcing that we should start thinking about if we wanted to um, look at progress? Like, are there any immediate gaps that spring to mind in our master plans of actions that we said we would do that haven't been done for whatever reason that you think are a greater priority now than before? Uh, I think in many... Sorry, oh. Miranda, I'm just going to step in there and just... Yeah. Um, and just say that um, Miranda's already indicated that the community boards are the, are the um, their plans are the indicators of where there might be gaps or where the community boards see priorities. Um, that comes um, through the capital program process and the decisions on um, what is put in the program and in what phase and rests as I understand it with the council. Yeah. Okay, Melanie. So two questions. Oh, sorry. Two questions, um, which are related. Um, the first one is: is how many um, suburban master plan projects are set out in future years that wouldn't be reported on at the moment? Uh, at the moment, uh, showing in the draft annual plan, we have uh, work underway in Linwood Village and the Main Street upgrade. Some work in the Main Road master plan at um, Monks Bay. Uh, area. There's also some uh, funding being uh, shared with the coastal pathway um, major cycleway from the master plan budget and under uh, that master plan, the ferry ma road master plan. Also showing is the up finishing the upgrade through Wollstone Village Main Street and um, funding is allocated to New Brighton master plan uh, land purchase for proposed RMAF road extension. So which ones are out in future years that would not make it into this report? It appears that uh, there's a two or three year um, pause on master plan capital projects until approximately uh, financial year 27, where Edgeware and Selwyn Street, street upgrade, um, have funding coming on board. Um, New Brighton also has a uh, several uh, uh, multi-year pause um, between purchasing land for the road extension and then um, following through road building and other public realm improvements in, in that area. So, sorry, a third question. So um, would it be much effort to, to actually just keep those in the report without adding anything in it so that they are continually reported on so they don't get forgotten? You know, they don't, you don't need to update them if nothing's happening, but they can just sit there so that we can see them every time the report comes through. Yeah, just a little section that says future projects or, or something. Funded but projects yet to be complete. I think, I think that would depend on where the funding ends up sitting in the long-term plan. Well, as long as yeah. funding is there in the long-term plan, which it yeah, presumably be will be. Yeah. Um, Pauline, then Anne. Yeah, so you could put, actually put that in the table on page 131, couldn't you, if you took that table right out to... Um, 2031, so you put out the total figures. But anyway, my question is on page 131. Um, Edgeware Village FY 1819, it's about $9,000 was spent there. Nearly what, what was that on? And if you can't tell me now, perhaps just a, a memo would do. Might have been something in conjunction with a cycleway, perhaps. Uh, there was that, some funding spent on the tree lighting project. Oh, yeah, but the, oh, okay, so that was when it was budgeted and it was just spent this year. 
Um, so that's the total cost of that? I'm not sure of the exact figure, but there was some funding allocated um, from last year, spent this year, <coughs> and that was on the, on the tree lighting, the, the work that went into <coughs> that. Well, actually, it would be quite could Would we be able to get some more detail around that? Because I don't know. Whether, can you remember, Mike? Was it fifteen thousand or twenty-five? Well, so we're, we're getting figures bandied around. It would be good to get clarity on how much that lighting cost, um, please. Because and also, it would be good to have more um, financial detail. Because with the Edgeware Master Plan, the community didn't want, didn't have an appetite for any more disruption. Um, after the cycleways and all the um, the infrastructure repairs they went through in that um, village, people were feeling the pain um, for their businesses. And I think we withheld something like fifty thousand. We pushed we pushed it out voluntarily to, as you say, twenty twenty seven. I don't think we actually pushed it out that far, but that's where it is now. Um, and we kept back, I think, fifty. So we're not sure how much of that fifty is left after that lighting project. Pauline, would you um, like that so information if you could through to the community that. board, maybe? Hmm? Through to the community board? Might be the best place for that. Yes, OK. Yep. And But possibly in this reporting as well? Yeah. It's, you know, I think I agree with Mel. There's not enough clarity on, on the figures there. Thanks. OK. Um, Anne, then Jimmy. Yep. Yep. <coughs> Kia ora. Hi. Um, I'm interested in the um, uh, 4.2, the community-led working group. And how you um, decide you know, who, who who was involved and how you got that together and yeah, just I'd like to know a bit more about that. Now's a great time to invite Josh Newman to the table. Hi, uh, the community-led working group. Uh, I understand is regarding the safety group. Uh, so both have been led both out of the community board and also with the, um, the inner city east revitalization group so the working group for greening the east that was set up by the community board in conjunction with the inner city east revitalization group that working group consisted of three members from the community board as well as um, three community members um, and they helped set up a plan uh, for greening the east alongside consultation with um, the wider community that they undertook on their own behalf. Um, the safety group, um, this has been directed around particularly Linwood Village. So it hasn't been a process that council has set up. It's been set up by, again by the revitalisation group. They've called members from various agencies. I think in total the um, request went out to 12 agencies and council sits around that table as staff as well as um, certain elected members are sitting around that table um, and we've also got representation there from the MP um, so it's a wide group it has a wide focus um, but uh, it is evolving and shaping and we're looking at ways staff can incorporate that with other safety initiatives in the city. Thank you. Um, are young people involved at all? The youth invited? <laughs> no comment. Yeah. Uh, there are other safety initiatives around the city, particularly targeted around youth mm. spaces, and we do have our community development workers working both within the inner city east and that safety group in the central city, so they're able to bridge that connection quite well. Um, but at this stage, there isn't a youth voice particularly on that group. Uh, I would say that the group is cognizant, though, of the youth experience, given that we've got social workers um, and as well as police on that group. Mm. It would be great if, and going forward, that that was a consideration when you, you know, getting these groups together to make sure there is that voice. That would be good. Yeah, I can Thank pass you. that yep. on to the facilitator Thank of that you. group. Thank you. Or you could nudge Jake beside you. <laughs> yep. Um, any further questions? So you've got Jimmy, then Yanni. Okay, I have two questions. On page uh, 123, uh, 5.2, uh, 
regarding to other potential suburban regeneration project, I remember the Pew with the council also not only mentioned this uh, four bullet point, but also regarding to the church corner one, you know, particularly in church corner, that kind of shopping center, that area, try to improve, you know, upgrade. I'm not sure why not in here. We have evaluated, even there, the uh, scoring is higher than the bishop there. So I, I don't know whether it's a miss out or not. Um, Council was presented a report around suburban um, regeneration priorities and that mm. included the heat map, mm. um, which I think is probably the, um, the part that you might remember. Yes. Um, and uh, Council, where staff put a, um, a list of recommendations, some year one priorities and then some future priorities. Yes. And um, the year one priorities were, um, as I recall, team remind me if I miss something, um, Central City um, and um, Linwood Village, yes. and uh, and then there were future years priorities. But council only resolved the year one priorities. So um, largely, that's what council staff are focusing on because there are no future year priorities um, that um, you resolved on. But we do recognise that um, there are other parts of the city. Yes. Um, Oh, actually, you also resolved to do some work on Bishop Dale, and, um, and that's, um, that's, uh, that's where your direction to staff ended. So that's what we've been working on. Okay, so the Bishop Dale also year one. It's year one. Okay, thank you. The second one is uh, regarding the, uh, the page 126, the southwest uh, uh, quadrant. Because I review your two kind of master plan, Sinem and the Solvents. Uh, street master plan, but actually it's a south. It's not a southwest. In southwest, the geographic area have any the master plan a moment? Uh, no, there's no suburban centre master plans that came from the southwest area yes. towards Hallsville, Hornby. Yes, uh, that area. The suburban centre master plans were a post earthquake response that uh, were focused around the centres that had the greatest impact following the earthquake. Yes. So um, the centres out towards the southwest, of course, were luckily uh, missed in terms of large earthquake impacts and the loss of key facilities that drove most of the planning around the suburban centre master plans. Okay, thank you. Yanni then Jake. <coughs> thank you. Um, just. One thing that doesn't really come through in the reporting on the master plans is the impact of district planning or land use planning. So if you read like um, Wolfston, for example, where there's a lot of detail around relationship to buildings to Ferry Road, um, bulk and scale, talks about a number of um, things that we'd like to see, including signage, but there seems to have been no mechanism to pick up that as an action and, and I guess the concern, like if you take Wolston for example, we've now got four gas stations all in a short space of road that have got resource consents, planning permission. So I just wondered um, what would be the process to get um, things that are mentioned in the master plans but not put into our district plan considered? We have through the master plan process uh, managed to drive some district plan outcomes. Uh, of course, you'll be aware that the independence hearing panel process um, happened at a similar time that these master plans were implemented and decided upon. So in New Brighton, uh, we did reduce the size of the commercial core and that was in response to the master plan process. And similarly, recently we did the plan change in Littleton and that really was driving some of those outcomes that we saw in the master plan process. Um, as part of our planning process, we do investigate if there are the need to change district plan rules uh, that would support centre growth um, or regeneration. Uh, we would look to do a plan change if there was a specific instance where it was valuable to do a change that would support that regeneration uh, need. Um, and I do hear your point there around um, some of the commercial developments post-earthquake along the Ferry Road corridor 
yeah. uh, maybe not being to the aspirations that were set out in the master plan. Um, so the the change would need to go through a plan, uh, plan right. change process okay. though. So the good news is we're doing a district plan change now. What's the process to get you to feed into those planning staff to put in some changes to address the principles and the actions and the master plans? Uh, there, I understand that there is a long list of the planning and I'm probably not the right staff member yeah, to talk I think that we might take process. that one. Can we get some um, advice on that? Because it's pretty disheartening when we're spending all this money and we've got all these great visions of these, of these master plan areas and then we're seeing development that kind of, you know, yeah. isn't so, ideal. Okay, so we've got, um, we've had uh, some time already as a council looking at the future district planning changes that yeah. are coming. So are you after um, some separate advice on any district plan changes that might be needed to enable yeah. um, master plan outcomes? To because support the master plan, to support the master plan outcomes to support master that plan we've outcomes. identified. Okay. So for example, signage is, is one that would seem to be, you know, a, a simple one, hopefully. Um, but I mean, staff would have to go through and look at what we kind of said in the master plan and then talk to the planning people about what changes we might be able to make. But, you know, I think the Sumner one's really interesting. Like it's really good feedback around Sumner and what it yeah. does for people. And I really appreciate you doing that research. Um, Can I just check with staff? Yeah. If there was a piece of work that we requested that was to provide some advice on district plan changes that could uh, help get the master plan outcome, so in those nine ma master plan mm -hmm. areas, how much work would that be? I think that's a district plan team. Yeah. Yeah, because um, if that's work that's going to be done by maybe the um, master planning staff and then the district planning, then then uh, that seems like a significant amount of work that would take away from things that we've already prioritised. Um, and well, just before we ask for that advice, I'd just like to have an idea of what that might take people away from. We'll come back. It would, it would be, a, I think it would be a combination of staff, but it would, it would be a significant input from district planning staff who right now I know are focusing on um, the spatial plan, the, nat um, the, the national policy statement on urban development. Um, there's probably... Um, We'll, we'll, so com we'll come back. So we'll, we'll come back on, on, on the availability of that advice. Yeah. Yep. So we'll, yep. we'll check in on that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I just thought staff could be very high level, like identified some of the gaps in terms of planning, like whether it's signage or permissibility that they could feed in. So that when we get asked by the planning staff, oh, are there any issues? I mean, I've raised them at the gas station already, but it would be good that, that's why it would be good to hear from these staff over those high level issues that they've observed so that when we get briefed by the So we'll, we'll follow that up and see what's possible at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Jake. Um, on page 131 on that second table with the master plan according to financial allocation, what, um, with the Linwood Village, that 52K that's sitting in 1920, What's that for? I mean, I know there's 1.4 for 1920, uh, for 2122 in terms of the streetscape, and then 61 after that. But I just can't quite figure out the 52, and then why the 1.4 isn't in the financial year as it as it is in the draft long-term plan. So the Limwood Village, the 52,000, that's for the Doris Lust Reserve upgrades yeah. and um, the children's interactive play art. Mm -hmm. The uh, the first phasing of the Linwood Village funding, that's to do the planning design consultation side of the Linwood Village streetscape upgrade, and then the later year is the build funding. So um, we're expecting that to be in the next next financial year. So is, is that design money in the 2021 financial year? That's in this current financial year that we're in. Okay, but, okay. So is there a gap of a year missing I'm just looking at the long-term plan, and I can see 1.4 in 21-22. Um, and I just would have expected there would be a design amount for 2021. I know there is funding at the moment in this current financial year, in 2021 financial year, to deliver that design element. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're fine there. Thank you. Okay. Right. Is there, are there any other questions? No? 
No, in that case, um, do I have someone to move the recommendations there, Jimmy? Any seconder? Melanie? Any debate? No, uh, Melanie? I just wanted to say that I do think, will those changes be made um, to keep in um, all the reporting on all the different suburban areas? Yep. Yep, so I think that's already been taken a note of to keep okay, those in. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Uh, in that case, all in favour, please say aye. aye. Any against? Declare that carried. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, team. And now we move to the fiscal recreation and sports strategy update. Welcome, Elizabeth. Good. Is Nigel here? No, he's away. Okay, I'll bring this one in. That's good. Right, if you can give us um, just a very quick run through and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so as, we, um, as the brief indicated, we're here to talk about the physical recreation and sports strategy. Um, as previously identified, um, this strategy was looked at to be reviewed. Uh, while looking at that process, um, we've deemed that in the current environment, the recommendation is that the strategy remains in its current form and that we look to really focus on what's delivered against the strategy and through consolidating current initiatives and planning, uh, forming a unit-specific action plan to, that can be effectively communicated both internally and externally. Great. Uh, questions? Uh, Jimmy. The question is, uh, because uh, these are the uh, uh, physical recreation sport uh, strategy has been established launch in uh, back to the 2002, over the last uh, 19 years, whether we have uh, de developed any uh, kind of action plan for the implementation or never, so now we thought that this strategy should be implemented, then we consider develop. This is my question. Um, in the years that I've been at Council, I'm not aware of a specific implementation plan that's been linked through. Um, there's been work that's been achieved through other other means within council, so through levels of service, and through through other aspects. Yeah, through your activity management plans, um, through the the go up every LTP, there'll be implementation done via that. But this is a specific implementation plan developed now to continue on with that work. I know my question is because we have a strategy, strategic uh, document. But actually, it's the main purpose for the implementation. But this one, over the last 19 years, we never implement or we have implemented. But maybe, you know, it's affiliated with some other strategy or not. I, I don't know. I think on that question, we can, we can get the uh, head of Rec and Sport to, to uh, come back with some details on that. Okay. Thank you. I think that would be good. Like, we've, we've got a draft sports facilities plan that's been just kicking around for about 10 years. We, you know, I was hoping we would have that in time for the 2015 LTP to inform where we were spending money on sports facilities, but we haven't got it. And basically, if you look at this recreation and sports plan, you know, one of the things is it talks about um, recreation sports facilities built in open space are well utilised and needs are clearly prioritised. So we've actually got that other piece of work happening, but there's no kind of link between the two that I can see. So I, I think it would be really good to get an update on, you know, because I agree we don't need to reinvent the strategy. There's actually quite, the principles and the values in it are quite good, but then it's got a whole bunch of actions that are just sort of going nowhere, and there's no alignment to the other work that we're doing. So how can we get alignment between the sports facilities plan, the children's playground strategy, in a timely way that informs our budgeting? and gives effect to the strategy. Uh, so in speaking with the planner involved in the um, sports network plan, uh, she's indicated that um, subject to resources that their draft will be with the uh, draft plan will be presented back through to the committee before the end of the year. So that, that body of work is separate to the body of work that we're presenting on today, um, but is indeed moving forward and going um, and will be coming back through to committee. But like what what's like, what are we actually going to consult our key stakeholders on? 
Well, it's engagement rather than consultation. Well, sorry, what are we going to collaborate with them on if it's not for, like, we're going to upgrade this sports park or we're going to build this sports facility? So this, this is talking about an implementation plan for the strategy. You've got different layers underneath that. There's a network plan being done for the sports parks. There's a network plan being done for play and rec facilities. They're all just parts of the jigsaw. So this, this implementation plan will come back for information here to this committee so you can have a look at, at exactly what you're saying, Councillor Johansson, as to how we're going to deliver on the different aspects of the strategy. So, so can I just check in? Does this sense. mean that you're going to be engaging on some of the key priority areas to see if that still rings true with the community? Is that right? Uh, so what we're looking to do is to consolidate the initiatives that are being completed by the by Rec and Sport Unit um, and looking to bring that together <coughs> with the planning that's um, been undertaken with the unit to identify um, what they're in, to identify what's is being delivered against the strategic outcomes of the strategy yeah. and not only looking at the physical recreation and sports strategy but also looking at the other strategic documents across council and also the um, documents externally that uh, feed in through to the work that is done. Yeah. And so that we are engaged to make sure that we're not duplicating what other organisations are doing and that what we do is um, complementary and not duplication. And there's a significant amount in Sport and Rec that's done in partnership with the community agencies. So sports agencies, are private providers. So it's about that collaboration that, you, that they can get by working together with those people. So the, the intention is... Um, and for an internal document that sits behind the strategy, but that collaboration and that uh, communication with those key stakeholders is vital, um, so that it brings it all together and as a city we grow forward. But, sorry, who are the key stakeholders? Uh, so, uh, currently conversations have started with um, Sport Canterbury, the CDHB, RSO, Sport NZ, so it's looking at those organisations that also deliver and lead sport uh, for the community. Right, and how does this um, compare to the spaces and places sports plan that Sport Canary did after the earthquake, like the sports recovery plan? Um, well, uh, reckon the Reckon Sport Unit have fed into the recent review of, of that document, which occurred this year, and right. so it's part of it. So it's part of that conversation around ensuring that, as has um, been indicated, that work isn't duplicated. But we haven't even seen that document. Like, we weren't involved in that review at all. It's not our document. Well, the Council's been very involved in it. Yeah. Just because we haven't seen it as a council, so you guys have seen it? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm, and if you'd like a look, I'm sure that it would be made available. I just so feel like we need it. to get a kind of presentation about all the stuff that's happening in sports and rec, because basically we've got our LCP budgets yeah, that we're so setting. Annie, so you, I don't know, you, you missed there. it this morning. Um, we've got a series of updates coming from the various teams now that hasn't happened in the past. So today we're starting with libraries and the art gallery, we're going to have parks, we're going to have um, rec and sport, a series of updates on the work that each of those areas you are know, doing. I heard that, I didn't miss it, but this, it's quite different to just being told what's happening versus having some governance oversight of decision making and where the priorities are. So that and so what I don't understand, like for the budget for example, we've got a whole bunch of stuff like a thing that's just we've heard just now that's been reviewed but we don't have any sense of that, and we're going to be asked to set our budget. So, so everything that you fund is in the activity management plan. So that's what activity management plans and LTPs are about. So the strategies uh, uh, guide the the work, you know, guide the direction. But actually, budgeting is done through the LTP and activity management that's plans, right. and you approve those. And, and so, you have if you go back to the sports the facilities system. plan, the idea was that we talk to the different codes, we we identify what the priorities are. And then that feeds in, we, at a governance level we sign off on that, that feeds into our budget, right? That's the whole point of us engaging with these stakeholders, is to find out what the priorities are, look at what the budgets uh, can be allocated based on what, what we agree. So I guess what I'm concerned about is that this is all happening after our LTP, and there's other work that's happening that we've just heard about today that could possibly be informing us. So I think that that's not a um, conversation that can be dealt with in this particular um, report that's here in front of us, right. um, but that's something that you might like to raise in an informal um, or part of the LTP process. Okay. okay. Yeah, and, I, and I think the key is that in, in looking at the old strategy, and I say it's old because it's 2002, <coughs> and when you look at the, the chart that was attached to the report, you see how relevant 
it all still is, and that's why the sense checking has gone on against Sport Canterbury and, and Sport New Zealand. So it, it, it's just a body of work that didn't need to be done, but we can put our energies into getting a three-year implementation plan and getting it back to committee. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, do I have a mover for receiving that? Um, Tim, a seconder, Jimmy. Um, any debate? Jimmy? Because uh, the, it's also my concern. You know, we have uh, lots of uh, different uh, strategic document strategy. You know. However, we didn't have a uh, kind of budget support to those uh, action plan or implementation plan. But this one would like to you know, consider working together with the key stakeholders and also partner to establish one. That's uh, pretty good. That's very, very, very good. But I'm still concerned that, you know, for instance, like a go to in here, particular emphasize all those sports and the activities, they are made available to all citizens of Christchurch and beyond. If that's true, you know, we still need to consider the geographic area or demographic area. There's a total uh, difference now. You know, we are diversified the city and the community, and the age, the children, or different ethical, possibly, you know, and high possibility, there are different requests, different needs. So this one, you know, is urgent to establish one, but also the long-term plan, I'm not sure, long-term plan draft one, we already put on the, the budget whether the time is sufficient or not. So this is my, my particular the, 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 the con concern, you know, yeah. Thank you. Any further debate? No, in that case, I'll put that. All in favour, please say aye. 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 Any aye. against? Declare that carried. Thank you very much. Right now we move um, to our first art gallery update. Welcome. Um, sure, uh, thank, thank you for you. coming in today. Um, just, just a quick note um, to councillors um, when it comes to the types of feedback. So take a note and we'll ask for feedback sort of offline later. Um, on the types of things additional that you might like. Thank you, sorry. Uh, uh, kia ora tato. Uh, Blair Jackson, Director of Christchurch Art Gallery, and Amy Harrington, my colleague who is the manager of our visitor services. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to update today. I just thought we'd go quickly through our, some audience numbers, some recent feedback from um, surveys that we've been undertaking. Uh, and I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about those surveys. They are undertaken by a company uh, called Morris Hargraves McIntyre, who we work with. The gallery team, in front of Amy's team, uh, 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 gets the data from our visitors, uh, and, and the, the process of collecting that data is continual, but we get a quarterly report. And this is um, a slight co a combination of the last three quarters. So uh, visitors to the year to date, um, as of that figure, but uh, as of Sunday, um, the past, it was uh, 2,330, uh, uh, sorry, 233,059. Yeah, uh, maths is never my strong point. Um, uh, of that, uh, what's interesting is that the gallery's 22% um, down on where we'd be normally, our normal targets, um, uh, despite the pandemic. And uh, interesting that the average total around the, the, the 100 uh, main galleries of the world is that it's about 70% down in reductions at the moment. Um, the uh, financial year to date, uh, we've seen about 8,420 school visits, and that's uh, approximately, we think we've got about 3,100 booked in to the end of June. But um, what's important to note is that 130 uh, sorry, 1,374 students uh, won't be able to participate in the program, which, um, because of COVID, is less than the average, which is 2,300 per year that uh, aren't able to be accommodated within the program. Um, uh, interesting, the, the gallery was listed in the International Art Newspaper as the 99th most visited gallery in the world in the last year, um, and Christchurch Art Gallery was seen as one of the world's galleries least affected by COVID. With um, we had the least closed days, and I think it was around 51. 
Uh, this just uh, is a visitor origin breakdown and it just gives a, a little uh, snapshot of where our visitors are coming from at the moment. And normally around in the kind of pre-pandemic times, the overseas tourists would be around 40-45% uh, somewhere around there. Uh, interesting, uh, the elsewhere in New Zealand is, uh, has increased greatly. Uh, slide four, there we go. Oh, sorry. There we go. Uh, there's some breakdown of some of the data that we collect. Uh, I won't go through every line, but you'll see that um, in the top uh, line is visitors agree that Christchurch, uh, that the gallery is an important cultural institution within New Zealand, and 94% uh, of our visitors agree. And visitors also agree that the gallery contributes to the city um, and adds to, adds to the optimism in the future of the city, which is 88%. Uh, Uh, and uh, visitors agree that the gallery strengthens and enriches the Canterbury community is uh, 90%, um, and our overall satisfaction for visitors uh, following a visit is 98%. Um, I just thought I'd go through a couple of the other ones too, which is interesting that 27% um, uh, of our visitors include a purchase from the shop in that time, and our current average sales transaction is $51. Uh, which is, is uh, very good. And interesting, our shop's doing incredibly well at this point in time. Mm. Uh, this is um, uh, just a little snapshot of, about people's, uh, we asked people if uh, they see that the, um, uh, the gallery adds to their optimism about the future of Christchurch, and um, you'll see that 88% uh, um, tend to um, agree or definitely agree. Uh, something that we've been doing uh, and uh, something that Amy's really driven in the last uh, little while is we've been surveying about well-being and it's something that we're um, quite interested in knowing what the result of a visit to the art gallery is. And uh, this is uh, statements that people um, believe has happened post their visit. So they're asked how they felt before and whether the gallery increased their sense of happiness or their sense of their days being worthwhile or their satisfaction in the day and their uh, connection in, into the world. And uh, it's, uh, um, it's great to see those kind of, that data coming through, and it's something that we're um, starting to collate over time. Um, I thought I'd just do a little, just a little walkthrough of some of our recent activities. Um, this is a uh, picture of a whole lot of a range of tours that we've been undertaking in, for school children, and it's a range of in-house and gallery Tours, but also uh, more interestingly, of late, we've been working with um, our partners, the uh, Tuaranga, the Botanical Gardens, the Canterbury Museum, and developing tours that take children and their families uh, through all of those uh, institutions. And sometimes the art centre is also included. Our latest one is um, Altatahi Go Wild. Uh, you'll see a lot of children and families up and down the boulevard uh, completing that at the moment between each of those institutions. Um, on a um, much uh, sadder note, the gallery hosted the memorial service for uh, one of New Zealand's um, most important and certainly most loved local painters. Bill Hammond was held um, earlier this year and uh, yeah, it was quite, quite a moment. Some of you may have been there. Uh, this is an event that happened at the gallery, uh, one of our public programs in February. It was called the Big Gig Night. Um, and a range of local bands played, uh, all of the galleries were open, there were a range of art activities as well, and over the course of the night between uh, 6 o'clock and 11 o'clock we had 4,000 visitors through the gallery. Uh, we've got another one planned uh, coming up in August, uh, and um, uh, the big gig night that night will be Hells of Popping, the Art of Flying Nun, and it will celebrate uh, 40 years of the history of Flying Nun and the artists that were involved the visual artists that were involved in that label, and um, it will tell a true kind of Otatahi story and reposition flying nun is very much uh, a story that came from Christchurch. Uh, some of our exhibition programs of late 
have included the Ralph Hawtrey um, Atiti show that some of you uh, may have attended the opening. It was a, a significant event for the gallery and a really good example of a partnership model of an exhibition developed, uh, development and we worked with the Dunedin Public Art Gallery on that and that's proven to be enormously popular and um, we're noting a lot of travellers coming in from out of town to visit that show. Um, each year the gallery op uh, offers a community group uh, or a charity the free uh, complimentary hire of our foyer space. Uh, this year um, we gave the space over to Qtopia, a group that is um, involved in the Rainbow Youth of uh, Christchurch. And um, I just thought I'd, I'd just kind of finish on a quote from that, um, from that group that we received following uh, our uh, event with them. Qtopia has been dreaming of a youth ball for years and the Christchurch Art Gallery was truly our dream venue. And for so many in our community, young and old, school balls haven't been a place where we have felt welcome or able to be ourselves. And whether we, were out, we weren't out or we weren't allowed to wear the clothes we wanted or we weren't allowed to bring our partners, we really wanted to uh, create an opportunity for everybody who missed out to have their ball moment. And for, and for so many told us, this is our first ball, as me. The gallery and your staff truly made it such a special night, having 500 rainbow young people in such a significant and beautiful venue in the heart of the city gave recognition to a community that doesn't, uh, often doesn't feel included, safe or welcome. But your team made everybody feel safe, welcome and loved, and that's such a special thing. That's it. So, questions? Lovely. Um, questions from people? Anne. Good and thank you. Um, thank you for the work that you're doing with um, building the, those connections with the museum, the art centre. I think it's terrific, actually. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of getting those school numbers visiting, what are the, apart from COVID, obviously, what, are the bar what normally are the barriers that stop school groups coming into the, into the art gallery? Uh, the, the numbers that I, I talk about that aren't able to come, mm. uh, aren't able to participate, are the students coming into wanting to participate uh, in, an, in an activity uh, designed by the gallery staff and delivered by the gallery staff, so it's really a capacity issue. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, and school groups are they are they able to come in easily, or do is um, cost of transport, for example, is that a problem for schools? Uh, for some think? schools, it is. But we yeah. work with uh, a community group um, who uh, offer assistance for low DSI schools that we uh, we point uh, schools low DSI schools to that, to that fund. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you, Jimmy. Regarding to the same figures, the first one, the four percentage visitor from the overseas. So whether it's uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic or not. Mm. But usually before the, before the COVID-19 pandemic, what kind of percentage? Oh, 40 to 45%, somewhere okay. around there. It kind of varies seasonally throughout the year. Yes. But we'd expect it to be around 45 to 40, uh, 40%. It just it, yeah, it depends on cruise ship seasons, skiing, etc. Okay, the other one is a repeat of visit, 68 percentage. Many is in a Christchurch or is a nationwide? Have any? That would be ma that? mainly local visitors that are coming back local. Yeah, more than once during the year. Okay, okay, thank you. And just one quick one from me. Are you still running the, um, the program where the school children, the bands and things come in and play at lunch times? Uh, no, that's a program that was run through, uh, through uh, events team at council and it's moved to uh, Tūranga. Oh, okay. We'd, no, that's, we'd, you yeah, were the venue for a while. We'd love to have it back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got some photos of my kids there. <laughs> okay, maybe you could run a competition. Yeah. yeah. Um, Anne. Can I just ask one more question, just following on? You talked about capacity issues, Blair. Is that space issues or staff issues, resource uh, It's It's staff and primarily. Primarily, yeah, right. Yeah. So if you had more staff, you would be able to run more programs? Uh, always, yeah, of course. Mm. Okay, yeah. cool, thank you. Thank you. Yanni? Yeah, are you able to provide any more um, breakdown of the schools, where that, which schools are coming from, which parts of the city? Uh, we, we, could, we could certainly, we would have that um, yeah. data, I could get that to you, but um, I don't have it on me, but yes, we, yeah. we keep a record of what, you, what schools are coming. Do you have any general sense of um, which schools are coming and which ones aren't? 
No, I, I wouldn't be allowed. Okay. Uh, I think that we've been yeah. told that circulate the information would be really useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that would be good. Yeah. Okay. Um, any further questions? If not, do I have someone move? Sam, seconder, Jimmy. Um, thank you so much for coming along today. D discussion. Um, good debate. for an update. Um, so all those in favour, please say aye. Oh, debate. Aye. Oh. Against. Oh. <laughs> what are you going to debate? Well, yeah. I was just going to thank I them for the yeah. job that they've done. They yeah. actually have done a really good job. <laughs> they so. yeah. Okay, and now for the libraries. I did. I, did you not hear me interrupting repeatedly? <clears throat> Nearly there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming along today. Um, the first um, sort of formal update this time, um, and I'll leave it up to you to go through it. Thank you very, very much, um, Councillor Templeton and councillors. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity. We know you've had a long meeting and we're, we're kind of the last gasp for you, but uh, we've, we're going to give you a, a little update and, and highlights. I understand you've got the presentation, uh, which is great, so you may have had a chance to have a look at it or can afterwards. Uh, I'm going to, I've got a number of my team or our team here um, who are going to um, contribute to this, and I'm going to kick off um, with um, uh, Kaifakahare Māori Aurelia Oraina, who's going to give you a little overview of both Māori and multicultural initiatives. Aurelia has then got to, uh, she's got to go after she's spoken, so our apologies for that. Um, but I, I think you'll really enjoy hearing from her. So I'll hand over to Aurelia to start with, and actually I'll better move forward. Mauri ora ki te whare, mauri ora ki te whenua, mauri ora ki a tātou. Me mihi kātika ki ngā mana whenua o tēnei takiwa ara ko ngai tua huriri, nō reira kei te mihi, 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 kei te um, I'm the manager of Māori services, but actually within my team we have two work streams. We have both Māori and multicultural. We have specialist staff who work in both work streams. Our kaitaka wainga specialise in the design and delivery of kaupapa Māori public programmes, delivered in te reo Māori or English across all age ranges. Examples of current programmes include a kohanga outreach programme where we deliver early literacy programming in te reo Māori, Ngā Paki Waitara, a regular Māori language story time session with attendees who come from across the city every week. Our visits by the Rehua Kaumatua group, uh, whose only complaint when they come to visit us is that I haven't bought those mattresses yet so they can't have a sleepover. <laughs> um, we're currently working on a collaboration with the University of Canterbury and Te Pā o Rākai Hautu on a Māori STEAM project. Um, and of course we're working on our regular upcoming Matariki celebrations in June. Our Paukohikohinga Māori specialise in reference and research inquiries, including whakapapa research, information literacy and school-based visits around our collections. Recently we've been working with a lovely man trying to rediscover his whakapapa. He had one name for us to work from when he came in. Over past months we've been able to find information and connect him back to his trust board and marae. Last Friday, he and his 80-year-old grandmother flew to Taranaki to be reunited with their whānau and hapū after generations away. He said, Staff really took me under their wing, showed a lot of patience and compassion. It got rather emotional for me. I just wanted to say how much I appreciate what a gift has been given to me and my whānau. Key partners whom we have worked alongside since July on various projects and initiatives include Te Rungango o Ngaitahu, Ngaitahu Archives team and the Whakapapa Unit, Rehua Marae, the Māori Land Court, Te Puni Kōkiri, Mātauraka Mahanui, uh, Te Taumotu Runanga and the Kao Kahuraki Multi-Agency Collective Impact Project that's um, being scaled across the East at present. Our multicultural initiatives are aligned to the multicultural strategy, in particular goals two and four. The programme and event focus and community liaison aspects of the multicultural liaison coordinator and the Pacifica outreach roles enable us to work more effectively with our communities. <clears throat> Lunar New Year celebrations were held in February. We partnered with the Confucius Institute and ran after school programmes, bilingual story times and bedtime stories. Lulette also coordinated an event with 17 groups from the Chinese and Korean community participating and performing on the day. Culturally informed holiday programs are offered throughout the year and there is regular attendance at informed meetings. 
partners, uh, partnering opportunities that we have worked on in the last financial year include the DIA, Office of Ethnic Affairs, the Chinese Cultural Association of New Zealand and the Japanese Consulate. The Pacifica Outreach role is a new role to my team. This role and an additional Kaitaka Wainga role have been funded by the New Zealand Libraries Partnership Programme COVID Relief Fund and are fixed term until June 2022. The role has been operating for two months and already we are seeing improved connection with the wider Pacifica community. There has been involvement with Rickerton High School Parents Pacifica Night. Um, the key highlight of the night, according to the attendees, was when they realised Teresa understood for Asa more and could speak in language, so there was genuine inclusion uh, for them at the evening and being able to understand what our service offer is and how they might engage with that. Um, Polyfest, we had a stall at this event with over 500 people visiting the stall. It's really good for us to be out and visible in our communities where our communities can see us. And the last group that I want to talk about is the Matua group, uh, which provides a time and space for Pacifica elders to come together while creating craft. Um, sessions are held at Tūranga, Aranui and South Libraries. Um, but the interesting thing with this program is that there's been an intergenerational evolution over time. So now we have younger women coming to join in with um, elders. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's enriching. It's enriching for all attendees. And I guess the last thing I wanted to say was when we talk about resilience and we look at research across different sectors, um, it's clear education, health, that cultural identity and cultural connectedness are key protective factors when it comes to resilience and strengthening communities. Um, and I know that my team and I are we're grateful um, that we can serve our communities and our roles here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aurelia. I really appreciate that. We're going to just keep on going. If you have questions that you'd like to, to ask of Aurelia, happy to take those later and we can come back to you. So uh, thank you very, very much for that. So um, handing over to Rosie Levy now. Rosie is stepping in for Chris initially for Chris Hay as, uh, as uh, Turanga manager. Chris couldn't be here today. He sends his apologies. So she's going to initially give a little update on Turanga and some of the programming and events and activities going on there. And then she's going to talk about digital inclusion and some other, and some other topics. Uh, Rosie's job, her role, is as one of the two community libraries managers. So Rosie, thank you. Tala for everyone. Uh, Turanga. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, lagging. I'm lagging behind, sorry. Okay. Um, we're a destination, a place for people to access reference and lending co uh, collections. We provide learning opportunities, hands-on access to technology and other resources. We offer spaces where our citizens can come together socially and for entertainment. And the library is an appealing venue for partners to deliver the events. Last December, the New Zealand Opera held a performance of eight songs for a Mad King. And that's the left hand um, photo there. Um, on the Harpori outside the TSB space. These types of events help drive up use of library uh, collections. And they give people one more reason to come to Tūranga. Earlier this month we had a locally developed autonomous electric aircraft on display next to the cafe. Our book issues and out of visitor numbers more than doubled over these two days. So the events help grow the usage of wider library services and they bring people into town. We continue to work with partners to make more of this happen. Coming up next month, we're part of the Open Christchurch series. We'll be hosting free engineering tours with the team who designed the seismic, seismic systems, behind the scene tours with librarians, a children's cardboard city making workshop and architecture themed book displays. And of course we can, uh, we will be again we will be a key venue partner for the Word Festival in August. Library teams are focused on doing everything we can to build on and reinforce the role of Tūranga as your centre of knowledge and exploration. That is on behalf of Chris Hay. Mm -hmm. And now I'll be speaking about Hornby. So Hornby is coming in um, 2022 and we are at a stage where we are engaging with our um, community around programming and services. Um, we want to be able to hear from the local schools, we want to be he uh, able to hear from um, community stakeholders about what they want to see in regards to these services. So um, some of the library services that could be on offer um, include uh, sewing machines, 
um, design um, direct to garment technology. So that's that whole technology where you can print straight onto a t-shirt or pillowcase instead of the um, iron-on transverse. Um, so um, that'd be great for that community. 3D printers, um, a laser cutter, virtual reality, esports, a whole lot of different programs that we want to be able to offer out in this space. So the engagement that we are looking to do is we'll be beginning in, at the end of June. So that's Hornby update. Final update for me will be around digital inclusion. So um, we have two programs that I'm going to speak about. RAD, we have a partnership with um, RAD, who is a recycle device scheme. And they uh, are a scheme where um, used corporate laptops are refurbished by school students. And in this case, it's Christchurch Boys High School who refurbish these laptops and then they are placed into the hands of those who um, can't afford them. And just some of the stories um, that we've been able to collect back has been around um, a young mum who has three kids under five, has received her laptop and she'll be studying um, interior design. Um, a direct quote from here is, for the first time in years, I am excited about what this year will bring, and this laptop will enable me to study, which I haven't been able to do with my kids so far. Another young woman is exiting a abuse situation, and she is using her laptop to study um, and make a new start. And finally, another young man, disabled, will be um, using um, his laptop to attend uh, ARA and um, start a computing course there. Um, the other initiative that we've been doing um, in our libraries is working with Skinny Jump, and this is giving access to our customers both um, to uh, subsidised broadband, um, and we have had to date 670 Skinny um, sign-ups, um, and this particular team, Limwood, uh, they were the highest jumpers in February and they won a morning tea, so the highest um, signing on of modems in the whole of New Zealand. So that's something to be proud of. Um, and also that the Skinny Jump was a, a very um, popular um, programme that was taken up during the lockdown last year. Thanks for Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Rosie. That's great. I'm going to pass on now to Erica Rankin, who's going to continue. Erica is the other community libraries manager, so each, each, um, both Erica and Rosie uh, have approximately half the libraries in our network, half the community libraries, each under their wing. Kia ora, everyone. It's lovely to be here today. Um, I'm just very briefly going to talk to you about a couple of things going on um, in my area. This will be the sixth year that we've uh, run the Reading to Dogs programme. It's incredibly popular and it's run at three of our libraries, currently New Brighton, Shirley and Papanui. We've built a great relationship with the animal management team to provide the service, and the programme's got a really successful profile. Um, recently, Metropole magazine ran an article on um, a book written by Sue Allison uh, on, it was called Friends and in, Friends in Deed. It's about assistance dogs, and this is what she said about what the programme means to one of um, our young participants. She said, young Juno's reading flourished when she joined the New Brighton Library's Reading to Dogs programme because the dogs don't notice when I get a word wrong. <laughs> we, and um, so that's obviously the, the picture with the dog who's so relaxed, he's obviously gone to sleep um, on the left. And the photo on the right is, sorry, it's not a particularly good one, but um, that photo there is of a programme running at Aranui Library at the moment um, for the two weeks of the school holidays. We've recently been evaluating the sorts of programmes that we're running at Aranui. Some of our um, more, um, the ones that, that work everywhere else don't work so well at Aranui and we've been trying really hard to hit the spot. So some of these things that I'm going to tell you about are hitting the spot. Um, this is a session here run by the Creative Trust, so it's in, we do this in partnership with the Creative Trust. It's a drop-in session and we're finding that drop-ins work really, really well at Aranui. The um, sessions where people ring up and book in just don't work. Um, it's, it offers a number of digital technology activities for all ages, stages and learning capabilities. And it's been wonderful to see families interacting with each other over these activities. 
the staff say that they've heard parents asking their kids to show them how to do some of the activities too. So families working together is, is really wonderful. One father was so engaged, they said in one of these sessions, that um, he was there with uh, several children of different, um, older and younger. The younger ones and the dad were so keen on what they were doing that they ignored the pleas of the older girls who wanted to go swimming next because they were so into what they were doing there and what they were learning. Initially, as often happens at Aranui when we run programming, some of the children um, weren't keen to, to go in and participate. They, they sit back and, and watch. But as soon as they saw what the ones who'd put themselves forward were doing, they were really, really keen and they all, they all come in now and it's going really, really well. Um, Staff said it's great to see the kids coming back also to challenge themselves to see if they can get up to the next level. So, and other programs we found, as I said, we are, we are trying some different things. Other programming, which is working really well at Aranui, uh, involved drawing and music in particular, and the use of garage band and the DJ decks that we have in the libraries are, you know, really sort of going off, as they say, so hitting the spot. So more work to be done in that space, but really pleased with what we're doing there. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. To pass on now to Elaine. Uh, Elaine Sides is our Manager of Content, Content Collections for Christchurch City Libraries. This is content in all its formats, print, um, print digital, and everything in between. So Elaine's just going to give you a little update. Sure. I'm going to focus on three areas of content, Canterbury Stories, the Discovery Wall, and the Library's website. Collecting the city's memory is an important function of the library. In the digital space, we've been supporting the implementation of the heritage strategy in three ways. The ongoing digitisation of fragile and popular material held in our archives collection, adding material to Canterbury Stories, our digital heritage repository, and providing users with the opportunity to create their own content and publish this in Discovery Wall. Canterbury Stories was launched 15 months ago using open source technology. Since then, we have added over 25,000 rare images and previously unpublished community and personal records and made these publicly accessible. It is fast becoming a valuable portal to the past. Many photographs have come from city photographer Doc Ross, the Orion or the old MED um, infrastructure archive, the Christchurch Star archive, and the library's own heritage collection. Among the rarities is the New Zealand Wheelman, a very fragile publication on cycling in the 1890s, and the Samuel Anstey collection of over 1,200 glass plate negatives from the early 1900s. Using Canterbury Stories, we've been able to create digital exhibitions, including one to commemorate the earthquakes, and to provide access to community contributed collections through our stories. Users can add comments to existing images and create their own sets of images to share publicly or privately using material held in the repository. With local developers Catalyst, we're working towards enabling users to add their own content <coughs> directly into Canterbury Stories. Meanwhile, we will continue to describe as much material as is possible so that those previously hidden treasures become available 24-7. Photo Hunt provides a significant contribution to the discovery wall. Last year, 21% of all our entries were uploaded directly into discovery wall. This was a considerable increase on previous years where most en entries were sent in for staff to scan and upload. The discovery wall holds over 13,500 images and these can be interacted with at Turanga, the mobile wall as it moves around the library network, or through the Discovery Wall website. Engaging with the community has been enhanced through funding received from the government-based New Zealand Libraries Partnership Programme. And this has enabled us to employ someone temporarily in a community stories liaison role to encourage community groups or individuals to share their stories and in time support them to upload their material into Canterbury Stories independently. This initiative has also given us the opportunity to identify gaps in our collection and proactively seek material to reflect the ever-increasing diversity in our communities. The library's website is the gateway to all that we offer in libraries. It gives us the ability to interact with the catalogue by tagging items with, um, with comments, 
giving us the ability to link large numbers of electronic databases we have to supplement our physical collections. It also um, offers various predetermined searches created to assist users to find new titles, and we have refreshed numerous book lists and genre guides to support that perennial question, can you please recommend a good book? <laughs> In today's ever-changing circumstances, it is more important than ever to provide communities with content relevant to their needs and to continue to offer choice. That's yeah, So that's the end of our presentation today. Mike, Mike, I'm sorry, just, sorry. I, I'm, I'm very leave. conscious of time, Madam Chair. Uh, you will, you will thank you very much, Elaine, uh, for cutting in on you. Uh, you will see Pat Street prepared a couple of slides on on program highlights. Uh, you've got those in the presentation. If you'd like me to talk to them, it's, so that's about the reading, summer reading challenge, particularly in children's university and esports. I can either say something or you can look at that at your leisure. Just, um, just be guided by you. Uh, I'm just looking at time. Yes. Maybe grab the the that, that information is in your is in your power in the presentation that I understand you've got access to. Um, we can no. Uh, ye yes, sorry, yes, you haven't got it. Yes, the, there are notes underneath with pretty much um, the descriptions uh, of, of it. Just make sure you get this information so we can see those. I see. We, we will make, thank you, we'll make sure that you, you get access. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll liaise with Aidan to do that. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, just, just so that they are also very important um, initiatives that we've been doing, but I'm aware that, yeah, we've taken a fair bit of your time. Um, the discovery wall, is there an ongoing cost associated with using that technology or where do you see it going? I was just interested. We have a, um, there is money that's um, put toward the platform fees for, for it. Um, so um, the actual content we create ourselves, but we have to pay for the, the platform that it's available through. And is that sort of meeting the expectations still that we thought it would when we got it? Or, I mean, just from a general observation, when I go in, I don't see as many people using it as, as I saw when it first got put in. Um, and I was also interested in what was happening with the community one. Right, so we'll start with the, the mobile wall, yeah. sorry, goes um, around the network, so it spends a month at each different library, so there's a, um, a structured program that goes there, and so um, we have staff um, being able to show um, users how to, how to use it. Right. Uh, it's also um, as a way of um, um, promoting the Discovery Wall website, which um, people can actually go in and add the material to. Um, and so it is also then we can move material from Discovery Wall into Canterbury Stories as well as put new stuff into it as well. So those two, Canterbury Stories and um, the Discovery Wall, interact um, with each other. So, yeah. Yeah. Councillor Johansson, we could provide some updated usage um, figures. I think that would be quite if, interesting. If you would like, yes, yeah. that's right. We haven't focused so much on the, no, on cool. the, on the stats today, but we can, we, can and, add, and just, we can add that to our notes. If and you I like. guess just the other thing in terms of the discovery wall, like it just seems to me such a shame. We're doing an LTP engagement. You've got this big wall where you could have amazing messages about what we're doing, but it doesn't seem to ever be used to do stuff like that. So I just wondered, is there any opportunity to use the discovery wall and the smaller one for what we would call public service announcements or you know um community messaging to encourage people we, to participate we're using i can see diane's <laughs> Elaine, sorry, diane elaine's wanting to answer this as well where did that come from uh, we're using our e-screens our digital screens throughout the libraries really more for that purpose uh, whereas the discovery wall is primarily about um, surfacing, making accessible our, our digital collections and content and those stories and images that the community wish to share with us there has been some really lovely stories of um, people finding a picture of someone in their family um, and um, then adding information about that picture, who else is in there, so it encourages engagement. Um, and I can be standing there having looking and then the next thing Carolyn's there doing the same thing and we're looking at the same thing. So there is that, um, that engagement. and. Um, the whole story about, oh, I feel, do you remember this? Oh, yes, I do, kind of thing. Um, so that is happening. Um, but I, I, am, I, 
also aware that it, sometimes you can come in and there isn't a lot yeah. happening in Tūranga, but it's only one part of discovery. It's just, I'm getting increasing feedback from people because everything's going to the web now, <coughs> that yeah. they're not seeing stuff at either libraries or at council in terms of ongoing consultations and engagements. Mm. So it'd be really interesting to see the LTP mm. figures. Unfortunately, Limwood Library was closed during the consultation, um, and we know that that area, and you showed it with the digital inclusion information, is one of the areas that where people struggle to get digital access. So I was just really interested in what we can do to be more, um, create more visibility of the engagements that we're doing that impact on people through the libraries. And I guess I just see it's a bit of a gap and could be and Maybe some information on that in the next report. Yeah. Thank next you for that stage. feedback. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. We'll pick up on that. So just remember for people, if you um, flick through feedback on the yeah, types okay. of content and the format and, and stuff. And we did give that to, to our comm staff who were engaging on the LTP. Yeah. So it might be good to hear back from them what they did with libraries, but... Certainly just from my general observation, I didn't see the level that I would have hoped. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. So um, thank you so much for coming in today. Um, You're and, very welcome. Yeah, thank yeah, you. and um, keep up the good work. And we'll, um, I'm going to bring up the wheelman very shortly. So um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Good thank up. you. Thanks, everyone. And we'll just um, finish the meeting with Anne and a karakia. <coughs> no mai. Mm, me mahi tahi tātou. Mo te oranga o te katoa, ki ora. We must work together for the well-being of us all. Ki ora. Ki ora. Ki ora. And with that, the meeting is closed. Thank you very much.